Hello and a very warm welcome to round four of the Super Prestige series brought to you by Telenet. Of course, it's round four. We are in Rudavorda today. Quite a different course that we've had in the last couple of races. Thanks for your company today. Before we kick off today's action, let's look back at the Super Prestige so far. <laughs> What a series it has been so far. Alvarado, Ardzufi and Castellan, our winners so far in the Super Prestige Series. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. Get involved over on Facebook Live, on the live chat, and also on YouTube as well. You can tweet me at Marty Mac TV, and I'll do my best to keep hold of uh, all of those. Uh, let us know where you're watching today, but don't panic. I'm not alone. Nikki Bramia is with us again today. As we said, she's coming in uh, remotely. World Cup winner, multiple champion is uh, Nikki. Thanks for your uh, your company today. How are you feeling after your commentary debut on Friday? Oh, the nerves are a little bit less today, which is good. But yeah, just excited to, to watch some good racing today. Today's course in uh, in Rudvorda, a little bit differently. The standings so far, let's have a look at the Super Prestige uh, standings. As you said, we've had three different winners in this uh, series so far. As you can see, Yara Kastelein is at the top of proceedings. She's just looking phenomenal this season. Yeah, definitely. She's just in the groove at the minute and just in her own kind of just... You know, she's she's just got that strength, that depth there to her this season. And she's a totally different rider to, to the last couple of seasons. So it's great for her. Now, last winter, you were here. As you said, you've won this race in the past as well. Tenth from memory uh, last year. So the riders that are up there, that Celine Del Carmen, Alvarado, Alicia Maria Arzufu, we kind of saw their, those two sort of breaking through last winter as well. They both had their kind of breakthrough victories this year again through the summer and into the winter again. They, they've stepped up massively. I think a lot of the riders have really stepped up this year and the races are quite different to how they were the start of last season. Like there's a lot of muddy races um, that have been already this, this, this year and that's what we can expect again today. And, and last year it was really more like a, almost like a criterium. Um, you know, there was like 15 riders even after probably half, halfway through the race. And this year I'm sure we'll see it split up a lot, a lot more than it did last year. Now we've uh, we've got Jeremy Powers out there in uh, Belgium again. Uh, so he has been out and about this morning, and he caught up with Katie Compton. Oh, we're just waiting for that one. We'll bring you that one in uh, in a second. Uh, this course, though, um, in the Rue de Vorda, it's it's quite it's quite an unusual one. It always gives us quite an uh, quite an exciting race. We had Koppenberg on Friday coming into this sort of race between those two different ones. Is your prep and warm up quite different between something that goes straight up a climb like the Koppenberg and then something today which is quite flat? A lot of the races, you just have to warm up as close to the race as possible. You want your legs to be revved up, to be fired up, ready, ready to go and smash that start, basically. Um, I think with with uh, with Koppenberg, it's yeah, the the camper vans and everything are usually quite far away from the start, so you have to be there a little bit earlier. Um, today, it'll be riders warming up right till the right to the start line, really. Okay, we're not far away from race action. We can bring you that Katie Compton interview. 
Um, I actually really like the course. It's a lot of like quick up and down. Um, there's quite a bit off camber that is super slippery. Um, I was able to ride most of it. There, obviously there's some sections where it's like bumpy and slippery that I don't think anybody's riding. Um, but I felt good. I enjoyed it. It's a matter of if I get a good start and don't get stuck in the riffraff. Yeah. Hopefully it all comes together and you know the, the, the first half of the first lap is good. Okay. And the sand pit because we saw a lot of riders struggling to get in and out of their pedals after the sand. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean the sand pit it's it's tough when you're riding through mud and then running through sand. Um, yeah, we're all going to struggle getting our pedals. I think that's just the way it is. Yep. Um, I'm going to ride my mud shoes today, so there's a little bit more clearance. Hopefully, that'll help with the sand. And your legs after the Koppenberg? <laughs> well, they weren't awesome yesterday. Like, I think I might be still a little tired, but um, you know, today is such a different race. Um, it's a little more speedy, and there's no climbing, so I got that going. There you have it, Katie Compton. Nikki, let's have a look through the uh, talk through the course today. It's uh, it's got a it's flat. The Helen Wyman was telling me as well the the farmer the way he drains this one. It means that the 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 mud is a bit slick rather than really really deep. Yeah, definitely. The um, the mud tends to kind of sit on on top um, of the ground. There's a lot of water that, that kind of just sits on top of the ground, so you can um, get that grip from underneath. Um, it's just a little bit slick on the top, so you obviously see riders looking for different lines, looking for the grass. Um, with the, there's a, so much sand in the course as well that it's really difficult to clip in and out of your pedals, and that can be quite an issue after after a few laps. We've got the steps coming in as well, and we were chatting before. You said there's always something coming up. There's always a, there's always a bit of an there's always an obstacle coming up. There's ne never any room to switch off in this race. There's always you always have to be thinking what's coming up, where, where you're getting off your bike, where you're getting on it, um, looking for different lines. You know, you often see Stana can kind of looking for different lines in those pre laps where where she can attack others later on in the race. Um, it's uh, you always have to be breaking the course down in in these races and looking where you can make your moves and where you can recover and where you can accelerate. So we're down on the start line as uh, we'll go full uh, screen shortly on that. We just saw Matthew Vanderpool warming up there as well. Saw so Sana Kant course riding in that preview ride from uh, Sana Kant there. She's, she... The riders just uh, ride it round to the start here. So getting uh, ready, rolling out. So we've got a, a really uh, big field here today. We've got 76 riders in total. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado got that front row position. Just uh, the full uh, general classification. So Castelline, Alvarado, Lechner, Azufi, Sanakant, Burst, Van Looy, Van der Heiden, Van Downschot and uh, Mount Captains. That is your top 10. All the mechanics just making their way down towards uh, the pit area. Nikki, is this a day where you really rely on your mechanics? So I remember you pitching up with your, your trailer and your mechanic just kind of pulling the back of the back out the trailer with all your wheels set up on it. I think the mechanics this season have probably had quite a, quite a shock to the system. The last couple of years, it's been totally dry, so they haven't really had to change riders bikes or anything and this year I'm sure they're full on and um, yeah you, you really have to rely on them in a race like this um, to pass you your bike when you need it for it to be fresh clean working as, as you need it to be so riders just going through just showing the uh, the commissaire their uh, numbers the I'll just run you through uh, I won't go through the whole uh, field because we've got 76 riders I'll pick out the uh, the favourites and then uh, riders to watch out for for uh, various nations that I know are generally tuning in. So Sana Kant, wearing number one, Anna Marie First is uh, here. Alice Maria Azufi is wearing four. Mount Captains is wearing five. Ava Lechner, you're a Castelline. There's Mount Captains there. We've got Alicia Frank, uh, Katie Compton, Katie Keogh, Christine Majerus, Inga van der Heiden. There you have it. So there's Alvarado. There's Verst alongside her. There's Katie Keogh behind her, Sophie De Boer in the pink as well, Anna Kay alongside her. There's Ellen Van Looy wearing number three for Telenet Balwas Lions. Sanakant always poised and ready. Sanakant and the close-up 
of the tyres. Alicia Maria Adzufi, then Inga van der Heiden. So Compton is behind her. And then right alongside her, Christine Majerus. And uh, Yara Castellan, second row start. Red lights for the riders. Watch the lights. You can see Barbara Borowicka, the Polish champion there. We are underway. We are off and uh, racing. Alvarado gets a good start. Van der Heiden straight down the centre. So Van der Heiden in the orange, getting a good start here. Captains of a Don Scott on the inside, but Alvarado gets that whole shot through that first quarter. So leading out here, Nikki, this, that, that first quarter, as you were uh, telling me before the start, is always a battle to try and get through that one. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy start. You don't want to be getting caught up in the back of that group there because you're just going to be yeah, it's going to make it really difficult in the uh, in this opening lap. You need to really have a good start, especially when the course is this muddy. Looked like Anna Kay had a bit of an issue quite early on there at the start. Uh, so we just saw her just drifting back just a little bit. So thanks to uh, Oliver Young for your super chat. The uh, start is always super important here. You can see how wet and muddy it is. It's Celine Del Carmen, Alvarado Sanakan, Ellen Van Loy, Katie Keogh, Mount Captains, Sophie De Boer. Looks like Marion Norbert, Ribarola well up towards the front of this one. Sanakan takes exactly the same line as we saw her taking in practice there, Nikki. That looks a good line. Just at the high line there, looking for the grass, looking for that grip. Um, you can see Celine's having to run this section, so yeah, that's good for Sana that she can ride that. That will give her confidence, especially even this, the, the, this first lap. Sana sort of seems like she's taken a while to get her momentum here, and you can see what sort of lead she's got through that section. She's had quite a different build-up to the season this year. Usually she's starting the World Cups right back in September, and now she's not really started the cross season till till start of October. Um, so she might not have that real top end, but I'm sure on courses like this you can use that power, um, and I'm sure you'll see her come through the field even more the next couple of weeks. Alvarado straight through to the front here, goes past Sanakan, Ellen Van Loy, staying uh, the usual uh, solid start from Van Loy, making the most of that front row start, and already this trio just through that section. Again, Nikki just demonstrates how important that, that course ride and that preview and getting everything dialed in before, just what a difference that it makes. Yeah, you have to be really decisive in these races and that's what a lot of the pre-laps are for because you have to pick your moment where you get off the bike, where you get on it, where you can speed up and um, that's why you see so many of the riders fighting for the, for the front of the race this early on because you want to see those lines and you want to just commit to those, to those different sections so you can put time into people behind early on. Nikki, just take us through this start here. As he said, they swing right into that deep mud. Look, Anna Kay and Anna Marie first just get caught. It looks like Anna Kay just went down on the inside there. It's super easy to get caught on those uh, on those poles, especially in that first in that first section, just because the start is actually quite short. And um, it looks like they've opened up a little bit compared to last year, to be honest. But um, yeah, it's you know you, you've got mud going in your eyes, your wheels are going everywhere. You're just trying to get through that that first section as smooth as possible, and obviously Anna just got caught up there on that post. So Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, the winner of round one in Heaton on this opening lap, already getting a, a good gap here, and we saw her out course riding in uh, the uh, preview as well. So we've seen her uh, do this early on this season as well getting a real flying start celine just seems nikki this year she's got such fast feet on her runs that's definitely one of her um yeah her one of her strengths at the moment is that running and she she rarely seems to come alive especially on these flatter courses with a lot of technical sections where you have to get off and on the bike a lot of times and um, she's she's a small rider she's explosive and I'm sure she came into this with a lot of confidence today. You know, she's Marianne. done well in Geaton and, and she's been up there most races this, this season and I'm sure she'll be after a win. Marion Norbert Ribarola is taking a little bit of a tumble there just at the start. It's a little bit of a gap back. They're just trying to run back on here. Sufi uh, Keo. Mount Captains, Christine Majerus, then Anna Kay seems to have recovered after that early issue. Good to see Sophie De Boer back in here as well in the pink. 
Sophie's had a few seasons where she's really struggled to, to find that, that form that she had um, about yeah three years ago or so. She's, she's had a few um, times where she's overtrained and not been able to recover and then struggled with races. So she's taken some time out to, to go back to basics, eat, sleep, train, recover. And um, yeah, this is her first race back since I think the World Cup's in America. So yeah, it'd be good to, to see her start racing again. She's just had a few, she said uh, on her social media in the week as well that she uh, felt that she, again, she, she's got to be super careful when she uh, feels that she's starting to get overtrained. She just has to just kind of throttle back a little bit, let, allow herself to recover. If you're tuning in, welcome aboard. This is the Super Prestige round four from uh, Rudevorda and uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado leading from Sanacant and Ellen Van Loy here on the opening laps. Now that we're just starting to settle into things, we'll just give you a full rundown of your different nations. I know a lot of you are tuning in and asking over on our uh, chat forums from Poland. Barbara Borowicka is here for Great Britain. Beth Crumpton, Katie Compton and Katie Keir from the US are here as well for other brits fiona turnbull zan crease is there as well Alderney baker ellie diltz then uh, katie scott mary lynn and abby may parkinson they are uh, in there as well rebecca gross also in there for the us with corey coogan cisek that is uh, your uh, brits americans your polls uh, michelle gagan on the start list as well for ireland as well wearing uh, number 16 in uh, this one so that says uh, the other nations represented we say 76 riders but one rider again what a phenomenal start to the season she is having will we see sana can come back on here into this uh, whoop section here it's it's such a it's a real i love this course nikki it's great it's great to watch probably different there out there as a rider <laughs> it's definitely a tough one to ride but at the same time it's fun there's always something to think about you, you literally can't hesitate for a second um, and you can see that the race is so much different from last year already these riders split up so early on um, but yeah ellen's having a good ride today she's not quite been up there the last few weeks and then yeah, obviously today she's feeling good, so it's, it's nice to see. So just uh, checking in, uh, Tyler Medaglia, no Canadians because it's Nationals this week. It is indeed Christopher Kraft taking in them from Tucson in uh, Arizona. Just the a good question here from Chicken Dinners, obviously wins a lot of races. Thanks for checking in. Uh, just asking, this is a good one for Nikki. Is it hard to get your training right on a season like this where the conditions are very surround towards being chased down by the world champion can she make contact again with uh, our leader just shows for Celine Del Carmen Alvarado and uh, apologies uh, if you're having a few issues with our uh, stream today through the uh, the big whoops rocking and rolling through here Van Loy Keo just making steady progress back to Ellen Van Loy this is a, the best start we've seen from Van Loy so far this season Ella, yeah, Nomi Ellen is one of the best starters there is, and she's kind of struggled a little bit the last couple of weeks to, to get those starts how she did last season. But obviously today, um, it looks like it's going well for her, and she seems to be in the flow. And Ellen always performs better on these flatter courses as well. She's got a lot of strength to her, so she can really get that power down, especially in the muddy sections. Um, Anna really versed after that. She had that issue with uh, Anna Kay on the start, but again, versed powering back through the group here it's, it's so difficult to make up time on the on a course like this when so much is happening especially that first lap if you don't quite get the best start it's it does take you a while to get back up there and um, hopefully she can do that but it, yeah there's, there's a lot of gaps opening up there already I, th I think Sana for sure will be benefiting from having some fresher legs and a fresher head because obviously she didn't do Koppenberg two days ago um, you know, you have to be really switched on and alert in, in this race, especially to be on and off the bike so quickly. So I'm sure she'll be benefiting from that. Is it, it, again, for Sana, we don't see her a lot in the summer, do we, in terms of what she does? She, she just seems, you know, we see her, she does the odd road race, but she's not a rider that we see sort of out and about throughout doing a full road season. She really is such a pure cross rider. Uh, Sana's 
Yeah, she's a real like old. She does it like a real old school way. She's really committed to the craft. She she knows what works for her. She knows that she doesn't want to race flat out in the summer because it it will pay. It will kind of get to the legs, you know, come November December time. So she prefers to go in a little bit fresher and kind of follow the old school route of of how they used to do it with the training and yeah. I'm sure the next couple of months you'll see her come in more to the front of the races. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado is there. Apologies if you have been having uh, an issue with our with the live stream. Something that uh, again tech problems. We're very sorry that uh, they have. I know they've been uh, working hard to rectify that. It does happen from time to time. My apologies. Uh, we uh, will do our uh, best uh, on that one. Oliver Young, good question for Nikki. Quest uh, is there a pacing strategy for the riders or is it just all, all out from the gun? Not really. I think it's all out from the gun, especially in a race like this. Maybe something like Koppenberg or Namor. You have to kind of save your energy a little bit. But for sure, this race, it's it's again and anything can happen at any moment so you need to give yourself the best chance to not have any problems or you know not back off in them early few laps because yeah you might need that time in the in the last two laps for example so i think everybody will be flat out here no one's holding back so a lot of you again uh, thanks for uh, thanks for chat uh, tuning in thanks for uh, bearing with us on the the few issues that we're having uh, that we had a little while ago so we'll, uh, again, thanks for, uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll give you uh, a few of your uh, shout outs. Uh, Brian Travis, question for Nikki here. What's the decision process for riders to choose between a one by setup and a two up? Uh, they're seeing both for today. You don't really get a decision, to be honest, because a lot of the sponsors, are, you know, they, they give you these bikes and you, you ride the equipment that they give you. And um, yeah, you can change between the chain rings on the one by setups, but the, that's not really a decision the, the riders are making at this point of the season. What's your thought? Would you, in terms of, do you think you've got on a one bicep, do you think you've got the variation of gears that you need? It depends on what kind of course it is. For this, for this kind of course, I think um, maybe a double chambering might be quite a good idea just because you've got some fast sections and then you get, you've got the sections where it's like really steep banks, so you need, need them really small gears. Um, it just really depends on what kind of course it is, to be honest. Katie Compton, Anne Marie Verse, Shirin Van Aanroy, Yara Casterline, your next group on the road. Katie Compton uh, on the course, not the road, rather. Katie Compton has uh, sent a, a, a pre race interview, seeing how her legs are recovering from Koppenberg. A few of our French fans just asking as well about the French riders. Are there no French riders? Uh, there are. Myri Norbert Riberola is uh, one of our French riders who is in here. Pauline Del Hay is another one of our French riders as well. And uh, for, uh, again, Ka uh, Kata Blankovas, the Hungarian rider, that was up there in Koppenberg on uh, Friday. Uh, so, well, she is in here. This great battle, 15 seconds is the gap now between Celine Del Calman, Alvarado of Corundon Circus, and Sanacant of Eco Creelan, the world champion. This great section, this sandy run up. Great comment here from William Keith. If Sanacant wins today, was she just sandbagging the earlier races to play with the uh, other <laughs> riders' psyches? <laughs> I'm not sure about that one, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good, good, good question, please. Uh, S. Scott, you, you, uh, you. ask it as well. Good question here. It varies as well. Uh, how many r bikes are each r rider allowed in the pits? Have you got a maximum am amount? I, I don't think there is a maximum amount, to be honest. I know Matthew van der Poel and some of the other guys, you know, sometimes they've turned up to races with eight or nine bites. It's a little, little maybe over, over excessive. But um, for the women, a lot of these women have two or three bites, which I think is like, enough, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. 18.33 is your time gap. Three to go this time. Three laps to go. And Sanakant giving chase here. The time gap to Sanakant is 16 seconds now, so it's opening. Here's Caitlin Keogh. And uh, Caitlin Keogh right now is on a real charge. The American is uh, moving herself up here. Caitlin Keogh. As, uh, she's having a she's great race today. 
she's uh, she's one that always comes back towards the end as well. So it'd be interesting to see if she can make any more time on Sana in those next few laps. And Caitlin as well this year. She's invested in a, in a in a full European winter. She was saying. Uh, Normally, Katie, she'll spend quite a lot of time in America and then fly back over for the, for the World Cups. But um, I remember speaking to her at Bowl last year and she was talking about coming over early September, staying for the whole season, committing to the, to the crosses in Belgium where, you know, it's the, it's the best competition there. And if you're putting yourself in, in those different race situations every single race weekend of the, of the year, then you're only going to get better in the long run. So fair play to her for doing that. Three laps to go. There's your so your top ten at the moment. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado again trying to get this off-camera section nailed. So you can see Odzufi Majerus K are 11th, 12th, and 13th. Ava Lechner. Uh, so those riders there, that usual charge by Odzufi and Lechner trying to come back. 126 is the gap. Just to give you your top ten here with three laps to go. So Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, Sana Kant, the world champion, chasing down 16 seconds. Keo is at 41 in third. Fokker Compton is fourth. Van Loy, then Yara Kastelein, Shirin Van Anroy, Manon Bakker, Annemarie Verst and Marion Norbert Ribarola. That is uh, your top ten. You can see them in there. Just a few of you checking in. Jolini from uh, Mexico. Thanks for uh, checking in. Jim Martin from Milford, Delaware as well. Thanks for uh, saying hi. Good to see so many of you around the world all getting on board today. So uh, again, uh, if, you've, uh, if you want a little shout out, if you're racing today, uh, let us know well, if you're promoting today as well. Uh, Paulo just asking, is there, is there, and again, it's, it's probably sponsor dependent, Nikki, if you get a choice, best pedal shoe combo for, for muddy conditions, but I suppose also where you've got so much sand. Yeah, it's, it's again, um, yeah, it's, it's what you're given a lot of the time or, you know, what your sponsors want you to use. Um, a lot of these riders are using Shimano setups for their pedals, um, and that's what I always used as well, and I just found that, you know, I was always used to them, and um, clipping in and out was always never really a problem, um, and, until it gets to a race like this when there's sand and mud, and you can, there's not really anything that's going to give you that much of an advantage, to be honest. It's always going to be difficult. Got a real battle between Caitlin Keogh and Katie Compton. Uh, uh, now Ke Compton's got herself up there. Van Loy just looks like she's fading on the after that great start. There's Shirin Van Anroy, the uh, Team 185 rider. Such an exciting young talent, Shirin Van Anroy. And only verse just trying to get up these steps. Van Anroy, we saw in the summer European time trial champion, medalist in the time trial at the, uh, at the Junior Worlds. And just 17 as well, this rider in the white and green. It's crazy to think how some of these young, younger girls, like how, how young they actually are, um, I think. It definitely helps. A lot of these races have been on TV for the last few years, so they can see they can, they can see what's needed to be up there in these kind of races. And they go to these uh, training sessions every week that are put on in Holland and Belgium, and they have um, a lot more experience and a lot more people to chat to about about techniques and everything these days. So um, you you can really see see the sport moving forwards with that. Yeah, phenomenal riders. A few of you just uh, commented on the mechanics. Uh, they say, GCN always say don't use a pressure washer on your bike, but the pros do. But there's a key to not blowing all the grease out of your bearings. The, the mechanics are, are real experts at, at getting your bikes prepped and back up for you when you come around the next time. Yeah, if, 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 if those bikes aren't ready when they need to be, you're not going to get a very happy rider. So, <laughs> yeah, they, they don't really have much choice in to just get the job done quickly. And, um, yeah, blast the bikes a little bit. <laughs> uh, just a little shout out as well to anyone racing in Waterloo, Wisconsin. They've got a mi muddy day uh, today as well. Here's your lone leader, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado. And when we uh, when we talk about young riders, she is uh, one of the finds of the last few years. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, as Katie Compton and Katie Keogh here are locked in a battle. The Trek rider and the Cannondale Cyclocross World rider. You had you you had a bit of a nemesis in your in your racing. You've both kind of hung up your wheels a little bit now. When you're up against someone from your own country, as they are, does it spur you on as well? <laughs> uh, 
mean, it doesn't really spur me on to be honest. It's like everybody is a competitor at that, that moment in time. So, you know, you're not really treating anybody differently or thinking, oh, she's a Brit, so I need to beat her. But, um, <laughs> yeah, you just want him to be the, you just want him to be first in that race. So if it is a Brit at the end of the day, then obviously you're going to be trying to beat her. But otherwise, you know, it's just a game on for everybody, really. There's, there's uh, again, that, that off canvas section. Just, again, it just shows we it seems like in the last few years as well, we used to kind of just go up and down a lot of the banks, but a lot of the organisers are putting the, the off canvas sections, there's, there's, there's a, such a knack to, to trying to nail them, especially in real muddy conditions like this. Yeah, the run-up plays a massive part into these off-camera sections. The more speed you can get into them, the better, because the, the moment that you stop pedalling or that you slow down on an off-camera, then you're just going to be you know, down on the floor. So you really need to power into those sections before, before you're actually on them. And that's, that goes a, lot of, uh, goes a long way with a lot of these obstacles in cross races. The effort comes before the actual obstacle rather than on, on the obstacle itself. Just a few shout outs as well. Bob Burnham checking in over on Twitter. Thanks for saying hi. So great to have so many of you on board. The uh, Santa can't never really uh, got up to uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, but we were uh, still got a couple of laps to go. The in terms of, we we talk a lot, Nikki, when we we look at a rider like this, and we term the lot in terms of you get out there and you're time trialing your way around and a lot of cross riders we see like Wout Van Aert, Matthew Van Der Poel, they can, they can time trial as well, but it, 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 you were saying, Tom, we were chatting before, it's a very, very different effort, isn't it? Cross is no, no other discipline, I think, you know, compare it to Matt. It's just so expensive. If you haven't got facility in that speed, then you're not going to need races and that people tend to think that if you come off a road mountain bike season you're automatically going to be flying for the beginning of a cross season but you really need to take time out in between seasons to focus on cross and focus on the explosive the efforts are just unlike else you could maybe maybe make um efforts above threshold maybe 300 times in a race so it's uh, different to road or mountain bike so a few of you asking if Nikki has truly hung up her wheels as she ride for fun. Um, Nikki's got a baby due in a few weeks' uh, time, but she's still on Zwift, um, if you uh, <laughs> check in on uh, Nikki Bramia's uh, social media. Yeah, I'm still riding at the time, and I think it's just that it just makes me have a happy day, to be honest. But um, yeah, it is definitely difficult to sit back for the races this year, especially when they're so muddy, because that's what I really, really enjoy. I always think, oh, maybe... Year out. At the moment, I'm just looking forward to having my baby. <laughs> <laughs> Celine Del Carmen Alvarado on the run up, looking great as well. She opened the uh, season with that win in the first round in Heaton. So if we look back through it, so it was, uh, it was Alvarado uh, from Kant in the first one with Castelline in third, Lechner Van Loy captains back of a Donshop Van Anroy in the hook, and that was the uh, round one in Boom. It was our Zufi that took the victory there ahead of Lechner. Great charge from the two Italians on that one. Sana Kant third on that uh, occasion. Versus Castellan Alvarado, well up there as well. And then last, the uh, the last round in Havra last weekend, as Katie Compton just goes through your picture. Our Zufi uh, at 19, Alvarado third. So just give an update if you weren't with us earlier on our standings. So Yara Castellan leads in the general classification from Celine Del Carmen. Alvarado just one point separating those two at the top of the leaderboard. 35 points for Ava Lechner in uh, third place and Alvarado leading as the best under 23. Yeah, there's, a, there's a great selection of races in the Super Prestige series. Like every, every single race course is different. You know, you've got Zonhoven next uh, in a couple of weeks' time and then that's Super Sandy and it's a real specialist course. Um, the, the Super Prestige prize money for men and women is equal and it's, um, it's, yeah, it's a lot of money to win these series overall. So the competition is always uh, red hot at this time of year. Swift bike change, Katie Compton goes through now. She's up to that podium position, so it's swung back and forward between the two Americans here that Compton goes through there at 50, uh, 52 
seconds. Caitlin Keogh at 103. That's your uh, top four. So looking good here then. Out of that corner is uh, Yara Castellai. Just trying to kick the kick the mud out of the shoes there. Then you've got the uh, Expurza rider, man on backer that's just leading Van uh, Van Loy and Van Anroy. So they're at one it's, it's, it's actually six. It's so hard not to over focus on not clipping in properly because a lot of the time they'll just be the shoes will just be resting on top of the pedals at this moment in time because you cannot clip in. I just remember this race for being like that so much. It's uh, you have to really keep your head in the race. And again, that's uh, you just see this little section here, this off camber section. Is there is there a point again when you come into the final couple of couple of laps when you're in this position that I just have a good close up here of uh, the mechanics in the pits just queuing up for the pressure washers? There's never a point in a race. It's not like the road, is it, where you kind of get into the final kilometre and you think, ah, I've got this one now. It you, it never happens in cross, does it? You can't. You, know, you can't ease up at all and think I've got this one right until that point where you cross the, cross the finish line because something happens you can lose at 30 seconds a minute minute and a half when you you know if you if you have to change bikes you can never get 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 um get complacent in these races you have to be on it the whole time you have to be focusing on what's coming up you can't be looking at who's coming up behind you because at the moment that you do that then you're going to hesitate and lose seconds you know anything can happen so a problem with the bikes and mechanical you can crash you know you have to keep keep the gas on all the time points as well they count towards uh, that overall uh, general classification and uh, the world cup the Super Prestige and the DVV Trophy. The, these these two series, the Super Prestige and the DVV Trophy, a lot of these races, these are some of the oldest races in cyclocross, aren't they? Yeah, especially the Super Prestige, that's been going for a long time. Um, I think only the last maybe 10 years they've had women's races there. Um, but, you know, this is, yeah, it has, all these courses have a lot of history to them, and especially with the Super Prestige series, you don't really get courses changing that much. You know, they, they've been this way for forever, for as long as they've been running. running. So um, that's why it's so good to know these courses when you're a young rider, because you know what to expect in the future. Just a few of you asking as well in terms of the men's race. We have that on the, on the hour, so it's about three quarters of an hour time from now. Yes, Matthew van der Poel is back. He's been uh, having a look, be, be prepping for that one, so we're looking forward to the return of Matthew van der Poel today. Can anyone compete with that one? But this is it at the moment, the battle, first, second, third, and fourth, Compton and Keogh, two riders here that are uh, battling for the podium positions, and Katie Compton has uh, got the better of her uh, fellow American at the moment. But again, the uh, Alvarado, Nikki, today has just been so far absolutely faultless. She's, she's just totally in the flow, isn't she? I think um, just getting on the bike, off the bike, she's getting she's getting on those points in the same place as every lap. She's she's just looking at where she needs to go. She's not focusing on who's around her or like looking behind or anything. She's just um, totally committed to each section, and that's what you have to do in this race. You can see how uh, she's, they... she's a super good she's a super good runner as well, the same as Sanna, um, and that can help so much in a race like this. Castelline, Van Anroy and Van Loy are your next group with Man on back. Are we going to go straight over course side and join uh, Jeremy Powers? Jeremy, what a race so far. Yeah, it's been fantastic. I'm here at the, basically the start and the finish line. And we can see that uh, yeah, Sean Khan is pacing really hard, trying to catch up, but breathing down her throat, Katie Compton. Yeah, Alvarado is off the front and super determined. The conditions here today, Marty, are gross. Riders are stopping here, right here on the finish line, trying to get their trying to get their uh, chains back on because they're getting gunked up like tar and feather with the sand pit not far from here. And in terms of anyone you caught up with before, we saw a lot of riders just uh, checking out the course early on, but the course conditions seem to have changed quite a lot between that pre-ride and, and as the day's going on here. 
Yeah, yeah. We saw a lot of riders um, making interesting decisions, you know, more narrower tires. The mud here is, I think everybody said the off-camber sections are the things that make this course so challenging. Obviously, the sand is also really challenging because it's it's just gunking up the bikes. And it's 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 the combination of those two is really, uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard day for the riders. It's also a hard day for the mechanics. And again, you've been out there, been watching Celine Del Carmen Alvarado. We've, we've been commentating a lot on the races with her so far. She's just been absolutely phenomenal this season. Yeah, she's on a personal time trial right now. She's tearing it up and she's going for it. It's a, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit wild to see just how determined and the look on her face, the rain and the mud is not putting any, uh, any stress on her. Today. There's a great battle going on between the two Americans, Keogh and Compton as well. There is. It's fantastic right now. There's basically, the two of them, there's only maybe 10, 15 seconds, but you can see Katie Keo. I just saw her go by. She's got that look on her eyes. She's dying to get on the podium. And yeah, Katie Compton's not giving up, though. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. We'll catch up with you in a little bit. Just saw uh, Celine Del Carmen, Alvarado, again, that uh, just come uh, to a halt at the top. Those, uh, those course markers are super solid, aren't they, Nikki? So Alvarado out of the saddle there. I think I've lost Nicky momentarily. It's uh, Alvarado just here pressing on with uh, this one. Sunakant still uh, working hard in uh, second place. Thanks for uh, all your uh, company on this one. So Celine Del Carmen Alvarado coming up to Yerling Vashkuren here from Pal Sows and Bingold really charging through this one. I had quite an interesting update from uh, from Helen Wyman just uh, before. A little bit of local knowledge from Helen Wyman out on the course earlier on. She said the field is owned by a farmer who drains it by using underground system of pipes. Compton here just goes down there. Compton, that front wheel just digging in there. So Katie Compton slides out. Will that allow Keo to try and come back to her? So Helen was saying it's muddy, but it's never going to get deep mud. It's uh, more sort of surface mud but slick and rutty um, underneath it does that again it, it, what would riders prefer nikki like super super gloopy mud because this must be really unpredictable it's, uh, it's it's definitely better when it just carries on raining to be honest because that mud stays really thin and it kind of just just kind of comes off your bike a lot easier but when it's when it's dry enough and the mud gets really thick then it's just going to stick to your bike and especially when you're going over the sand as well then everything's just going to stick to it um, a lot of these riders will be riding completely uh, dry um, dry chains today. They don't want any lube on there whatsoever because that's only going to add to the problems with chains and gears. Explain that as well for, for someone that's coming into this. Again, is that if if the bike goes down in the sand as well, you don't want the you know for the for the chain to be collecting the the sand as well. Does that make a massive difference to running it completely dry? Definitely, and on, on races like Coxider where it's totally sand or Geaton or, or Zonoven, you want your, your chain to be as dry as possible because if you've got a load of oil on there, then the sand's just going to stick to it and that's going to cause you a lot of problems, um, you know, with, with the sand sticking to your chain and then, yeah, you're going to get a lot of problems then. So a lot of these riders do the total opposite of what everybody says you should do and just uh, ride their chains totally dry. One lap to go, 37.19, the time they're racing so far. Last lap, let's see uh, what the time is. Back to our chaser, Sana Kant. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado has just steadily uh, pulled away. As a few of you commenting about the, uh, the lap riders, normally you get pulled out when you're at 80%. Sana Kant having some issues with the, the zip on her skin suit. So going through here at uh, 37 seconds now is the time gap. As uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado uh, goes into the pits for bike change, picks up that European champion's bike for the uh, under 23 champion. As, uh, again, uh, Celine's younger brother is uh, a Salvador also uh, coming into racing as well. Yeah, he's great. He's also a really a great cross rider, and I'm sure that they train a lot together. Um, you know, they'll go to the training sessions in Alf and probably every weekend on a, uh, every week on a Wednesday. Um, and you know, there's a lot of Dutch riders that go there. They train with each other. 
push themselves through the week. Um, and he'll, yeah, he'll be a great rider in the future as well, I'm sure. Sure he will. And there's, again, just you see, just losing the footing there. As we said, that's why you cannot uh, let up at all in cyclocross. Never think that you've got this one won. You can see the way the bike dancing around underneath. Here comes Yara Castelline. She's going to go through in fifth. Manon Backer is going to be next. Sheeran Van Anroy is uh, past. Ellen Van Loy, so 148 back to Sheeran Van Anroy. Ellen Van Loy, uh, where you can see her taking a, grimacing. Yeah, taking a big breath there, maybe a bit of a, a few back problems with just that heaviness of the mud and trying to get that power out on these sections. It's not easy even to keep the bike upright in a, in a straight line. It's, uh, you've, got, you've got to keep moving forward. Alija Maria Adzufi going through there, and again, that uh, that familiar style. Laura Vadonskot is the next rider going through, and then Anna Marie Hurst is uh, going through in 11. So Vadonskot's up there. Anna Kay has made a good recovery here. So Anna Kay, if you went with us, had that problem right in that first uh, corner. That's a really good recovery from Anna Kay. There's a, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's definitely not easy to... Um back through this race on the first corner so she's done really well there. And, you know she's a rider that really performs well in the in the faster really you know criterion style races and um, so these might not be the ideal conditions for her today but she's she's made a great recovery there just a uh to get, just to update you as well david mccormick just asked yeah it's an 80 percent cut off for uh, the uh, lat riders back up and uh, Castelline, Castelline, a phenomenal season. The triple seven rider has had, the, ooh, goes down there. Um, man on backer just slides out there at the bottom for Exposer Foot Logics. Van Am Roy, Van Loy are your next riders. Alicia Maria Zufi working hard to get back in here. And then behind her, Laura Vadon, she got versed for triple seven they triple seven have been so dominant haven't they after the over the last couple of weeks they've really like come together and like they work so well as a team off the bike you can see they're all there giving each other confidence you know they've got Clark, Clark Wellens looking after them and um, yeah they're thriving this season and they're really pushing the, the sport forwards and um, yeah they're, they're, they're great this season the final lap. Thanks for joining us today. If you're just tuning in, welcome. This is round four of the Super Prestige Series here in the Rue de Vorda. Your lone leader is Celine Del Carmen Alvarado from Corundon Circus. Is she setting up a potential double for that team today? Remember, that's uh, on the hour at 2 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. Uh, European time. We have the elite men's race with the return of uh, Matthew Vanderpool. So this will give Corundon Circus quite a boost if uh, Alvarado can take this one. The leader of the under-23 classification, second place overall. And again, that shows as well uh, why you see behind the leader Yara Castelline didn't have a great start Castelline Odzufi was in uh, fourth in the general classification get, you've got to in that position Nikki try and even one rider in front of you can make the difference between winning and losing the whole series yeah every every point counts in this series and obviously there's eight rounds to the series so you want to be picking up as, as many points as you can throughout you know there's 30,000 euro to win at the end of this um, and the riders know that and they'll be yeah they'll, uh, they'll definitely be chasing every single position they can the the equal prize money we get we kind of we've got a ways to go a lot in women's pro cycling haven't we because it must it must have changed a lot since you first went in as a as a pro rider I can remember a lot of the races we were always kind of just alongside the junior boys and everything would be rated upon what they got and now times have changed a lot. There's still a long way to go and you know we should be getting an equal prize money. You know we do, do the same amount of, of training as them. We, we're physically um, as capable of, of, of them as, as we can be um, and so yeah we, sh we should be getting an equal prize money to them. And again, the uh, the pro teams as well, the pro cross teams. We've got Celine here benefiting as well from that backup, just from the whole infrastructure of Corundon Circus. That makes a, a huge difference for, for pro women as well. 
I know that a few, a few years you would never have got a, a, a male uh, team having women women alongside it as well, um, and that just shows how, how far the sport has come in the last couple of years. Um, I was on the first women's team to really be established, which was Telenet Sadea, and they've kind of led the way in the sport in doing that. Um, and now every men's team you rarely see a, a women's team alongside it, which is which is how it should be. And they learn a lot from the guys, and they have that support, that backup, and that'll make a huge difference to these riders. Tough conditions for the riders. So Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, the Dutch rider, originally from the Dominican Republic. Another great ride. What a season that she is having. Looking to try and take the lead again in the uh, Telenet Super Prestige series. And you can just you can just see physically here, Nikki. You've you've been in here, you've what you've won this race. After this length of time, you can see the, the how much it how much it's hurting now. Your legs are just burning, your body's just burning, you're just trying to keep moving forward and, and trying to not make any mistakes on this last lap. That's all you focus on is that finish line and, and trying to get there as, as smooth as, and fast as possible. And, you know, maybe you might even change a few things in the last lap, run a couple of more sections that you would have ridden just, just to keep on the safe side and, and keep that gap there. So I'm sure, um, yeah, I know how she's feeling and she just wants to be smooth and, and get to that finish line. You loved conditions like this as well, didn't you? <laughs> oh, I, I'm so gutted this year because this is like the, the conditions that I've dreamed of the last few years. And we've always had <laughs> super fast, dry, hot courses. But yeah, anything muddy, you know, drops, kind of a lot of different obstacles, technical sections. That's that's what I really loved in cross. And uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's great to watch, watch races when these conditions are like they are. Alvarado running this section, as he said, Nikki Bramia with me, won this race in 2012, has been on the podium, was 10th in this one uh, last year. She said she knows just how Celine Del Carl and Alvarado is feeling here. This one, no, uh, no mistakes you want to make on this final lap. Every uh, second counts. It's the world champion, Sana Count that is uh, plowing on here, second wheel. Sana, from where she started, uh, sort of first race as we saw the season, now just seems that she's just starting to find her groove now. Sometimes it definitely takes a few races to kind of get into the groove across, know the different accelerations and just get, get used to that real top end, top end efforts. And I think that's what kind of Sana's, Sana's doing now is finding that bit of top end where she can start to push on in races and, and fight for the podium and fight for that win again. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure the next few weeks we'll see, her, we'll see her going for some more wins. So now it's getting rid of that sound. We're not far away from the finish line and bringing our winner home today. And this rider here, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, just pushing the course tapes right to the uh, the last millimetre here. Santa Camp battling on, just lapping those riders just ahead of her. As she remounts at the top of that one in to the home straight now here is your winner today celine del carmen alvarado of corin and circus cleans the mud off the sponsors on the front of the jersey such a pro high fives the crowd as she goes past here she is the winner of this one this should give her the lead back now in the telenet super prestige series another superb performance from the Dutch rider. And then we will just now uh, look back for our second placed rider, Sana Kant, it was, that was behind her. And there she is, the world champion. Sits up, closes his skin suit. Having a, a little wardrobe malfunction today for uh, Sana Kant. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not really ideal, is it? But she's world champion, so any, anything goes, doesn't it? Let's make it work. <laughs> Is. Here's your third place, Katie Compton for the USA makes the podium in that one. Great to see Katie Compton up there and uh, on to the podium today. Had quite a battle with this rider. Caitlin Keogh has a glance over the right shoulder just to make sure she will take fourth. So 19 seconds was your time gap back to Sanakant. Katie Compton at 38. Katie Keogh now for Cannondale Cyclocross World. Dot com. That's a good, solid fourth place today for uh, Katie Keo. That's uh, she should be. She should be fairly happy with that one. Definitely, these these are her conditions. She loves these kind of courses. You know, again, 
a rider that loves the muddy conditions and um, maybe a bit of a warm up from Koppenberg two days ago helped her just to unblock her legs a little bit and she uh, she's found some form today so that's good for her. Yara Castellan, she went into today as the leader. This is a good uh, finish for Castellan. She's going to take fifth, and so good points scored. Backer is the next rider to finish in uh, fifth. Then Van Loy just manages to out sprint the young rider, so the 17 year old uh, Van Anroy. Bit of a generation shift there as well, Nikki, on that one. Yeah, definitely. A bit of a, bit of a mixture up there, isn't there? And everybody first uh, comes back into ninth place. So uh, Verst and Azufi. So that's your uh, top ten rounding out that one. Laura Vadon Scott just fades uh, a couple, uh, one place here, just outside the top ten for her. Ava Lechner, the Italian champion, is going to come in in ninth. Anna K will be your uh, your next rider to finish. So uh, as we were saying, uh, Anna K, little issue on that inside line. It wasn't ideal for for her anim animity verse today. No, definitely not. You need you need a good start in this race. You know, you're straight into those technical sections after a very short time. So you need running. Um, it's definitely a hard race to come back to come back through the field when you get a start like that. And what can we say about Celine Del Carmen Alvarado there? Again, just another yes. uh, absolutely uh, phenomenal race as we see Annick Van Alphen uh, coming in next. But she, again, got her, set, got her nose in the, on, in the lead, just never looked back. Definitely, definitely, definitely a massive class there from Celine. She's, uh, she's technically great and she's obviously strong at the moment. Um, and she's really took advantage of that today and, and she never looked back and that's what you need to do. So, yeah, fair play to Celine. She did great. For Compton and Keogh as well, we had that great battle for the podium. Katie Compton in the end coming in in third. Caitlin Keogh coming in in fourth. For the Americans, it can sometimes take uh, two or three weeks to sort of get over the sort of jet lag and the sort of fatigue from, from that, from the, the changes in time difference, can't it? Yeah, for sure. You need a few races to kind of warm up and especially the, the riders that maybe are a little bit older, you need you need a little bit more time than these young guns to, to try and find your legs, to try and find your form. And I'm sure Koppenberg would have been a good little opener for him two days ago and, and they seem to be thriving today. So yeah, it's a great race from them too. We saw great battle as well. The battle between Van Anroy and Van Van Loy. There, there's kind of that sort of general. You would say sort of kind of we kind of skipped on it there. A bit of a generation shift between the the 17 year old Van Anroy and and uh, Ellen Van Loy in the, in a in her late 30s. Yeah, Van Van Anroy really came back to it towards the end, and Ellen's someone who really can keep one pace throughout the whole race, and um, she faded a little bit towards the end. But um, yeah, it was great to see the young one, the young one jumper at the end. So we've got the men's race. It goes on the hour. We'll be back about 10 to for our uh, pre-race build-up. But recently, Jeremy Powers caught up with Niels Albert. Continuing our tour of Belgian cyclocross legends, we're here today in Tremelo, Belgium, at one of the icons of the sports bike shop, Niels Albert. He's going to take us through his shop and show us some of the cool stuff that he's collected from over the years of racing and all of his friends that were in the sport. It's going to be a little bit of a history tour. It's going to be a little bit of cool stuff and insight from Niels Albert. So let's go. In May 2014, Niels Albert announced to the world that he had to retire from racing. The two-time world champ and Belgian cyclocross superstar declared that he had an uncurable heart arrhythmia and would have to retire from racing immediately. Four months after his retirement, he was recruited to work with then up-and-coming superstar Wout van Aert. Niels guided Wout to three world championship gold medals in 2016, 2017, and 2018. And well, the rest is history. So we're here with Niels, who is not needing a huge introduction, but has been Belgian champion, let's just say many times. Yeah. At least yeah. once as an elite. Yeah, 2011 as an elite. It was a nice jersey, I remember it. Yeah. yeah. I think four times in the junior under 23 and twice as an elite. Yes, Fam Famously in Coxida. Yeah. Where we've heard that you have a dune named after you there. Yeah, yeah that's that, correct. That is pretty, that's pretty, 
Yeah, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. You're like, hey, uh, to your wife, let's go take a walk on the beach. And she's like, well, which one are you thinking? And you're like, I'm thinking Coxida. Yeah, Neil's <laughs> Alper Beach, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think over, I think 11 World Cup wins. Um, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, okay. I didn't a count bunch. them. Yeah, like, a bunch. Yeah. A lot of wins. A lot yeah. of wins. And you've worked with some of the top names in the sport. Wout Van Aer and most recently Lauren Sweek. Um, top names and you've had a lot of fun with that. Obviously your career, you've retired, but now you have this awesome bike shop and you've asked some of the riders, hey, can I have some cool stuff to show off yeah. in your shop? And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna take a little tour yeah, okay, of, fine. of the Niels Albert bike shop. This one is the first one. Um, I get it from Wout after the world champion win in Zolder. It's 2016. Zolder. Yeah, and Zolder. I was also there. That was a really, Crappy day. Yeah, it was <laughs> bad weather. And, terrible uh, weather. Yeah, terrible weather and also very hard for the material. Yeah. Because it was sand and raining. Yes, and, uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. This, was, this one is the first this one. This is eh? his first World Championship. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, for, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. What, what, can you describe like a little bit of that? Obviously for you, I think that was like proud, proud Papa Bear. You yeah, had to be pretty happy for him. Yeah, that was uh, the year that uh, he had a crash with uh, Mathieu van der Poel. That's right. And you saw that Mathieu was stuck with his feet in uh, Wout's uh, That's front right. wheel. That's right. And uh, after the crash, uh, Mathieu's head was down. Yeah. And Wout was riding, riding, and wins in the final. He wins uh, the world title. I know. So, but I think they were both. They were, yeah, they were same boat yeah. even well. I yeah. think that day. But yeah, Wout was uh, mentally uh, a little bit stronger than yeah. uh, Mathieu that day. I I think about the first one. The first one for me is special. Yes. Um, because I was retired two years, and yeah. uh, it was yeah, it was Belgium Zolder. And when I think about that race, and it's still the... Uh, you get goosebumps. Yeah. Still, That's cool. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at number two, because yeah. this one has a pretty cool story as well. This one is from uh, Luxembourg, from Brail. Um, this one is the bike, um, yeah, with the special tires. Huh? Yeah, I know. There's a lot of talk about these tires. Normally, we make, uh, we built the tires special for uh, normally when it was snow. Yes. Um, but then, yeah, they are a little bit old, so they are really tough. Uh, and that's why we put them on tires because yeah, when it's snow, then I was thinking yeah, on snow, and then you can put a little bit low pressure in your tire, and you have uh, more feeling. Yes. Um, but then the conditions were uh, totally different. But there were a lot of rocks mm. in, the, in the in the muddy sections, and uh, yeah, with the new tires, it was yeah, there were yeah, yeah, not tough enough. I don't know, and it was. One of the other of the flat tire and Wout was keep riding, keep riding and yeah, yeah, that's right. So he had no flats. No, no, and, and, no one. And I think Vanderpool had how many? Four, I think. Four, four or five. And there were yeah. people that literally went through all of the wheels they brought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was yeah. done. Yeah, some guys it was totally done. It's over. Yeah, they yeah, can't keep. Over. They couldn't keep racing. They flatted so many times. Yeah. They didn't have any more wheels to be able yeah, to I, keep going. I can remember the day that. <laughs> Some parents were walking around in the pit area and ask, yeah, you have some wheels, you have some wheels. Uh. That is... Uh, so it's a crazy day. That is crazy that the tire is like, it's just kind of the right combo of now being thick enough. No, of course, but... Now being, it's flat. Yeah, I know, <laughs> I know. But the thickness of the, the rubber would be different than a traditional tire, right? Because they're so, they're so thin now and they want yeah. all of the flexion and the movement. Yeah. But this is like so thick that it was able to prevent the flats yeah. is like... I think that was the difference. It's so cool. Okay, let's check out some yeah. other stuff. Okay, so <laughs> good. Yeah. He had wings on this day, man. That was not normal. Yeah. <laughs> he was yeah. on another level. Dude. So this is his third one from Valkenburg, yeah. which was, in fact, my last World Championships. And I have to say that I did not have a great memory from that race. Oh. <laughs> I know the conditions were terrible. Terrible really, is, really is not even like the correct word. It was think, worse than terrible. I think six rounds. Yeah. I think the professional guys did six rounds. It was from think I think ten or eleven minutes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it was really a strange, uh, strange race. Yes. And, uh, yeah, Van der Poel was the big favorite. Of course. Um, but then we we saw in the last couple of days that the track was changing and it was really heavy, and that was. Uh, yeah, Wout was growing mentally during the week. Yeah. From the last World Cup to the to the World uh, yes. Championships, he was yeah mentally growing. Yeah. Yeah, and 
Uh, we talked a lot, and yeah, it's possible, Wout, well, it's possible. Don't and I to try also to think that Matthew had a lot of pressure to win. Yeah, yeah and he I had never, so. he hadn't won since his first title. Yeah, I and think I, so. And I think that, and Wout wow, just uh, truthfully, his running was on, mm -hmm. it was in phenomenal. Yeah, he was running so fast. Expected Valkenberg to be really hard, but never did I expect it to be that um, the ground to move so much and the ruts were. Like if you got stuck in a rut, it was practically up to your yeah, fork. It was so yeah, deep. That's really strange. So, yeah. yeah, I remember he rode a more narrow tire for this race. I think, yeah. right? A thirty or a thirty-two? Yeah, thirty. Thirty, uh, right? Yeah, Which 30. was something that you would do also in your career. Yeah. I remember you were at Namur running. I think a thirties, yeah. or maybe yeah. in the front or in the rear or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe sometimes both. But the thing is. Um, I was always saying when, when, when the mud is not really deep and it's just upper, yeah. then I think you can ride also with 30. This was his last world championship yeah, that he won. The last one. And this was also the last year that you worked with him. Yeah. Then, it you, was the last then year. he switched to a different team. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Let's look at your bike. This bike yeah. looks. This is. Was this from <coughs> your last season of racing? Um, no. This one was. Uh, we start racing with Colmago. I was world champion in 2009, and I think this one is from 2011. I think so too, because uh, you were uh, going into Louisville, you were the world champ, and I'm pretty sure you rode this bike in yeah, the, yeah. the warm up race in Louisville. Yeah, yeah, I think also, yeah. Yeah. Because another one um, is, is hanging over there, it's a blue one. Okay. And I think the Dura is, is different. Nice memories, huh? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and also. You have a, your nickname was King Albert. Yeah. Right? The, the, <laughs> and they put a, yeah. a small a small detail here on the on the, the uh, custom Dugas tubulars. Yeah. Very few people get the world champ stripes on their Dugas tubular, and yeah. very, even fewer have a uh, the crown on them. Sven's bike is over here. Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. This one's from his last year. I remember uh, it. I was still I was, I was still trying to beat him. Yeah. Although he he was yeah he was more vulnerable when he got older thankfully yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, he was still good. In 15 16 was his last year yes. and uh, then that year he won one race in uh, Coxade yeah and that was with uh, disc brakes yes and uh, he had two bikes with disc and I think he has he has one and uh, I have also one bike with disc brakes um, but I don't know exactly which one he won yeah. that day yeah. So, yeah. Maybe this is the one. Maybe this is the one. Maybe the one at him home. I don't know. Uh, well, when he wants it back, he doesn't have to come far to get it. <laughs> no, I buy them. Oh, this, one, buy. I, this one I buy, so it's mine. I'm this mine. You can't when you get work it back. with Sven, you have to buy your bike. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. I get it. What do you think was your best, your favorite battle with Sven? My favorite battle? He, oh. said, he talked a lot about you with the sand. Uh, he gave you a lot of credit for being quite possibly the best rider that's ever ridden the sand, period, ever. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the strongest part from Sven was, um, he was, yeah, he was riding really tactic. Um, and the thing was, he was really um, powerful in the last five minutes of the race. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 yeah, his biggest, my biggest frustration was that he, uh, he, he gives in, in one second, it was, and, and there was a gap from there was a gap from five, six, six, five to six seconds, seconds, and um, yeah, I couldn't close it yes. uh, to the to the to the finish line. So yeah, that was the biggest uh, power from Sven, I think. That un, when you don't expect it, yeah, in, in a few seconds, pat 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 up and. Yeah. It was a close gap. And, yeah. Yeah. and then it's one mistake and then he's gone. And, and then he's gone. Yeah. And yeah, but it was always in the last round, in the last two rounds. Yeah. Um, because he know um, I think he knows when uh, when he had a strong day, mm. then he can ride also yeah, in one hour full gas. But I had Sven more in the end of his career. Um, then we have begin making the biggest fights. Yes. Um, and he know I can ride for one hour full gas. It's yes. no problem. And Sven was more uh, explosive yes. than me, and I think that was his biggest uh, strength. Of, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Next, let's see what we have. Uh, what else we have? Uh, the thing that I'm most proud of it is my own bike from the Coxhaven. Eh? It's the most impressive bike for me. Then I remember it well. That was a. Uh, <coughs> 
that was a this was a this was an incredible day to watch. You rode like a flawless race. Yeah, I, I was think... in this race, and uh, I'm I'm not even joking. I think I was in like maybe 16th or 17th place with like four other national champions, yeah. and you lapped us. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, not technically, but the UCI like pretty famously pulled. It was me, Christian Hoyla, Francis Moray, uh, like a lot of good riders, you know, that we battled with. Uh, yeah, and they said, okay, you have to stop because, and I thought, holy crap, man, <laughs> who is I going know. that fast? No, of course you did. You are winning yeah, the but championship. Yeah, but now I, I didn't know it now for Yeah, yeah. it was uh, an impressive day, no, to okay. say the least. Like you are the, I don't think you made one mistake on this race. Yeah, that day, yeah, for me is the, yeah, it's my biggest, uh, my biggest victory um, of my career, and yeah, it's a special one yeah. for me. It's still, uh, it's still a special moment when you can win uh, the worlds in Coxad on your favorite sand yes. track that's yeah, yeah. ever built, yeah. I think. Yes. Um, yeah, with a lot of history with yeah. uh, Paul Herreigers also in '94. Uh, yes. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's a track with a big history, and, is, and you yeah. can win the worlds. And, and I think still for the moment, the worlds where the most people are there in one day. I was gonna say I think they said because they had special trains designed yeah. just to take the fans yeah. to and from the venue yeah. because sixty one thousand. Uh, sixty one thousand. Yeah, we uh, we have to say that. And is this a photo from it? Is no, this, this is, this a, is Zonhoven, maybe. No, this is a photo I get I I get it from Ridley, uh, and it's a photo from Zonhoven. That's what I thought, yeah. But, yeah, it's the start of the professionals, um, but I'm already gone, I think. Yeah, I like this is This is from a turnout, I think. <laughs> we see this, tell me about this, like, this picture, because this is very, this is very uh, Belgian, like, I see a lot of these, like, yeah. types of pieces of art that people have yeah. drawn. The guys, uh, they, the guy they make uh, the picture is uh, Nestor, and, um, yeah, it's a, it's a famous guy, and he makes, yeah, some, Car caricature? Yeah, characters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from special, special moments. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he, he, he built it, he painted it, and uh, I get it. And I, <laughs> what I is the uh, significance of the snowman down in the bottom? Just that it was bad weather? Yeah, maybe when it's winter. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, there was no snow in Coxade. So, no, not uh, this time. And I get it from uh, from my world title in uh, in Coxade, So uh, yeah. Was uh, yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah, it's nice. Pretty cool. Thank you for taking us for no a tour, problem. man. This no is problem. beautiful. If you're ever in Tremelo, is that how you yeah, say it? Yeah, Tremelo. Tremelo? Tremelo, yeah. All right, Tremelo. Yeah. <laughs> I try. If you're ever in Tremelo, you have to come through. You may see the man himself, Niels, because you're here. Probably all days. Yeah, all the time. So you can come get a picture with Niels, check out some of the awesome history that is in this shop, and uh, pay a visit. Yeah. Thank you for having us. No problem. Thank right. you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Vanderpool, welcome along. It is round four of the Telenet Super Prestige Series. We are in Rudevorda today. Lots of anticipation surrounding the return of the big man himself. What sort of form will he be in after a big summer on the mountain bike and on the road? Jeremy Powers is out there in uh, Belgium and he caught up with him this morning. Uh, for now I'm feeling quite good, so <laughs> it's uh, really nice weather here uh, today and um, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, it's your first race back, obviously. You have not raced against Eli Gisserbeet or Tom Pidcock. They've been showing that they've got great form coming up. Excited, nervous, probably both? Yeah, not really nervous. It's sad because it's something I do for a long time now, so it's, uh, it's a habit. and. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit curious how uh, the guys are doing and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You're ready to rip. And uh, this course in particular, do you like it? Is it something that favors you? Yeah, it's one of my favorites, uh, especially in, this, in these conditions and um, yeah, I hope uh, I'll find the, the good pace today and uh, have a good technique. Great man, thank you so much, good luck today. No problem, thank okay. you. There you have it.
He's back. We're about 10 minutes away from the start of the elite men's race. Nikki Bramia is with me today. We, she is with me remotely. Uh, a former winner of this uh, on this course as well. Nikki Matthew is saying there, one of his one of his favourite courses. And uh, last winter, there wasn't really a course that wasn't one of his favourites. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't think his competitors will like him saying that, that it's one of his favourite races for the first one back. I think they'll all be a bit of a bit, bit threatened by him already. So, yeah, I mean, uh, he's been racing these kind of races for years, so he knows what to expect, even though this is rarely his first race of the cross season. It should be interesting. It's the million dollar question, though, isn't it? Is how you know, where where will he have been since the end of the road season it is a good one. And, and how good can he be coming back into cross when everyone else has been racing for, you know, for quite a while? You can see definitely this this year he's had quite a quite a different summer to usual. You know, he's concentrated on a lot of the mountain bike races. Um, obviously, Road, road Worlds was a major goal for him and he was flying there, but just didn't... Uh, yeah, he, he just blew at the end of the race. And obviously that shows he's a, he's a normal human being. Um, and I'm sure he took a bit of a rest from that and he's coming back into the to the season. And he, he knows what he has to do to be up there in these cross races. And he was obviously outstanding last season. So it'll be it'll be great back ha having him in the field again. And hopefully the other guys can, can put up a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a race to him this year. I think he's hoping for that as well. Let's have a look at his cross schedule um, that he's put up. So... Rudavorda, the European Championships next week down in Italy. We've got Neil, Tabor, Hammer. We've got the Ambience Cross there in Vakvaka, Coxsider and uh, Cortrix. So uh, not quite as busy as we've seen him in the past. No, I'm sure it's going to be a little bit different this year just because his, one of his major goals is going to be those Olympic Games next year um, in Tokyo. So I'm sure he's had all this planned for a long time and, and it, these, these are the races he wants to select and, and race and, and that's what he's going for at the moment. Now let's have a look at uh, our course, the, uh, the, the course here in uh, Rudavorda. I know, uh, as we said, you've, you've won on this course. It's, it's, quite, it's quite muddy. We've got some, we've got some rain. So we've had, we've had quite a lot of proper cross conditions so far this winter. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot a lot of things going on in this course, especially, you know, you can never relax, you can never take a moment to sit back. You know, there's always some kind of obstacle coming up, whether it's stairs, uh, sand sections, tight corners, off cambers. And, and again, this race will have, uh, the course will have changed quite a lot since the guys have been out on it earlier in the day. So, um, yeah, it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting and you have to really be switched on for it. Let's take you through this. So we've, we're, we've been working with Expers of Foot Logic. So, uh, Nikki, this section, this is Alicia Frank that was course riding a little bit earlier on. This section in particular was, is causing the riders quite a lot of problems. There's not an awful lot of grass left on it now. No, it would be totally muddy now, and I'm sure a lot of the guys will be having to run it maybe um, just to fight because they won't be finding much grip out there. And a lot of these corners and off cameras you have to... That you don't really carry much speed into them, so it's difficult enough in the dry, never mind how it is at the moment. So Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, you can see there. So this top section, if you weren't with us for the elite women's race, it's got a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of uh, of grass left. Um, there's the the nice whoop sections that we've we've got on this course. The sort of almost like big BMX berms that we've got here on some of these big banks. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a fun, a fun race to ride, you know, there's always something, always something else to focus on. Um, but at the same time, you're having to really dial in those sections every single lap, every single time you go through them. And there's a lot of concentration that, 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 that you have to have in this race. You know, you can't, you can't kind of look elsewhere for a second. You just have to keep your mind totally in the race. We saw that little section there, not quite sort of like the rhythm sections that we've seen on uh, on other courses. Again, lots of off camber that you can uh, that you can see here on uh, this one. Got a lot of uh, there's quite a lot of bridges to cross in this one as well. As yeah, right. They they I don't think TV kind of does them justice sometimes. They they're a lot steeper than they look. The the bridges. Definitely steep bridges, yeah, and especially when you're coming in very, very slow, which is obviously what the mud's doing now. You can't carry much speed into them, so by the last few laps, it's really just about having that explosivity, explosivity that power just to get over them. Uh, Nikki for a second there. 
I'm back again now, so. <laughs> <laughs> So in terms of the, in this course as well, the, um, for anyone that wasn't with us a little bit earlier on, Rue de as well, they, they used to run the, the sand hill as a descent. Now it's a kind of dead turn into a, into the sand and uh, into a climb. Yeah, both, both, uh, both ways were really difficult. Um, but this way, especially, you don't really carry any speed going into those sand sections. So you're trying to get, gather as much momentum as possible before you get in the sand ride halfway and then you have to pick a moment to get off jump jump off run and just be a uh, get to the top point as soon as possible to get back on your bike it's all about keeping really good momentum in this race and not losing any seconds and um yeah just keeping keeping that flow so we'll go as the riders you can see down on the start don't forget get involved over on the chat front if you want to so post your your questions for nikki if you want her insight if there's something that you're watching if you're new to cycle across if you're happening across our broadcast here on gcn racing for the first time feel free to put your questions up on there twitter i'm at marty mac tv if you want if you would rather uh, get in touch via twitter you can do that as well we'll uh, we'll go down on the start so matthew vanderpool you can see on the start uh, here, Nikki, it does attempt your UCI points just for right for viewers that are that are wondering. I know there's been a lot of uh, comments about it. Do your uh, do your UCI points kind of carry into the into the next season? Yeah, they carry into the next season, but it only lasts for one season. So you can't carry points from say two seasons ago. It's constantly rolling over. Um, it's quite a complicated system for, for people that don't really know, to be honest. Um, you kind of lose points from one season and then gain them the next. Um, but obviously, Matthew's got a lot from last season from all the races that he's won. So you'll see him there on the start line at, on, the, uh, on the front row. Hence why, when the, just to explain that as well, so those viewers that you will have seen Lars Bohm and Jadenek Stibar and riders like that coming back in, and just because they're big names, um, they don't automatically get a front row start position. It's not done on, hey, they're a personality, they were a world champion a, a few years ago. No, definitely not. You have to, yeah, if you've, not, if you've been out for a couple of seasons or you've not quite done as many races, then you're going to be... Uh, you're going to be fighting for them positions in those first few laps just because, yeah, you're going to be, you're going to be on the back row. So you can see the clock there, 14.57. So uh, just a little over two minutes to the start. There's uh, Callum McLeod just uh, heading up towards the start for Canyon DHB Bloor Home. So I'll just run you through some of our favourites. You're seeing them across the front. So Matthew Vanderpool for Corridor Circus, Tone Arts for Telling at Bowers Lives, Michael Van Turen outside a good season so far, Laurent Swake, uh, Lars Vanderhaar, Quentin Hermans is here, Courtney Van Kessel, Gianni Vermeersch, Kind of solid uh, season so far. Gianni Vermeersch, Ellie Isabit, Marcel Meissen and Dan Suter. Jens Adams wearing 13. Joris Neuvenhaus is here as well. Tom Meusen, Tim Malia. There's Ellie Isabit. Uh, a lot of, uh, I think Matthew Vanderpool is hoping for a battle. Tom Pidcock though, Nick, he's got quite a good, even though he's not on the front row, he's right behind Matthew. Sorry, can you say that again? I just missed you there. <laughs> Sorry. Tom Pidcock, even though he's not on the, the front row of the start, he's got a fairly decent start position behind Vanderpool. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, if he can choose that position, then he'd, he'd definitely be on his wheel. You know, he's, uh, Tom hasn't had the best starts the last couple of races, but managed to work his way back up there. Um, and obviously, following Matthew, you can probably be guaranteed a good start. So, yeah, that, that's why he's there. Run you through a few other nations to watch out for. Tyler Cloutier from the USA is wearing 25. We also have Max Judelson and uh, Andrew Giuliano. So uh, Max Judelson from Rock Lobster International. I used to have a Rock Lobster mountain bike. It was one of my favorites. Uh, Andrew Giuliano from Grit World Racing. Tom Pidcock from TP Racing. You've seen him. Uh, ben Turner's wearing 43 for British fans as well. Joe Williams is wearing 54. James Swadling from 8.8 .8 Group. Cameron May. Uh, wearing 57 is a little bit further back. We also have Elias Nielsen from Sweden. As Callum McLeod we saw from Great Britain in the blue of uh, Canyon DHB. Tyler Loftus from Wheelbase is uh, wearing uh, 63. Ryan Middlemas from Loftus Tours is wearing 64. Uh, we also have... Uh, the Thomas Main is uh, the other rider that's in there wearing 82 in the yellow. Tartaletto, Iserex, and our other Swede is Lucas Mortsell. And uh, the Italians, uh, 
in terms of there is also have Alexis Krast from uh, Latvia in there Michael Van Turen out there is your series leader Lars Van der Haar Van der Haar is uh, at the top of the general classification 37 points one point ahead of Quentin Hermans Connie Van Kessel third at 34 they are poised and ready watch the lights we are uh, getting ready for the start look at the anticipation so for Mirsch He's a bit Vanderpool arts and we are off and racing away we go so it's a right hand turn Meissen battling there the German champion to find his way through he's a bit and Vanderpool tone arts Tom Pitcock right behind there Michael Van Toren out just on the outside so uh, the lead into that first corner there Vanderpool's got a good start so has Ellie Isabit. So on to the mud from that road uh, sector. Oh, going down on the right there. The course marker, the Corrington Circus rider, took quite a tumble there on the right. And uh, it's that it's that washing machine effect, isn't it, Nikki? On the on a start like this with the big bunches that we have in Super Prestige. Yeah, the, there's ruts and lines everywhere at the moment, and it only takes one rider to go down, and you can bring about ten riders down with you. So. Um, it, it's quite easy just to go into the tape and, and just just as that has happened there, it's uh, not ideal for, for the start for sure. Let's have a look through the start. So Vanderpool, Isabit, so just again, Marcel Meissen, we saw right, wrestling to try and get that good start position. Riders just clipping wheels going down there. Can't quite see who it is from that. I'm sure we'll get a uh, shoulder it was. that took. Was it Mayusen that's gone off there? Maybe, we'll yeah. Could be. So uh, onto this section. Tone Arts takes the low ground. Isabit Vanderpool take the high ground. So Isabit and Vanderpool just getting a couple of meters advantage here. There's a huge amount of pressure on Ellie Isabit here, isn't there? After the start to the season that he's had to prove, almost to prove that he that he can compete and go uh, go pound for pound with Vanderpool. Yeah, Isabit's definitely got a lot of pressure on him today. Even though he shouldn't, you know. He's Still a young rider, but um, yeah, he's uh, he's been winning everything pretty much this season so far. So uh, yeah, the, the Belgians will have a bit of pressure on him, I'm sure, for, for going up against Matthew. It's almost though it can almost have the the reverse because he's you know he's 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 kind of in a win-win situation because if he wins, he's like hey. I'm the daddy. I've been up there all season. If he doesn't, it's like, well, hey, you know, he's the best. He's what there is. I've learned something from this one, and and I and now I know what I have to do. He doesn't really have anything anything to lose, I guess. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah. Matthew obviously is, is Matthew. Everybody knows how he performs, and uh, yeah, it's just everybody else is trying to take the fight to him and that battle to him. And uh, yeah, I think maybe maybe they don't overthink it too much this this first uh, couple of races with him, and they just need to see where it's at and, and see what they can do to try and match him or or beat him. And Vanderpool as well for him. It's first race back. He can almost sort of takes the pressure off a little bit. We've got a huge amount of expectation on him in that rainbow jersey. But again, it's that, hey, first race back, just got to maybe find the groove a little bit over the over the opening couple of laps, just get those lines. Does it does it make a difference? You, you've done uh, throughout your career where you've had big road seasons and then you come then you come back into cross. Can you do, do, does it change you sort of physiologically as a rider? Yeah, definitely. I, I noticed when I, I did the Olympics back in 2016 and did a lot more on the road that year than I ever had done and it definitely knocked a lot of the speed out of my legs for the cross season and I had to go work quite hard at that uh, the following season because, yeah, it's very difficult to come into cross at this high level and, and be explosive off, off a road season. You need that cross preparation, you need rest around races to, uh, to be that explosive through the season. I mean, some riders have it and other riders don't and you have to really work work at it to, to get it right so it should be really interesting to see how Matthew is uh, is going to perform after after the summer that he's had. Is that Thomas Main has got a good start that we can see there is Thomas Main again for Tartaletto Isarex get the uh, the shot that we get here in the Super Prestige the cable cam a beautiful shot that it gives us if you're just joining us welcome aboard this is the elite men's race here in the Telenet Super Prestige series in Rue de and it's Elie Smith, Matthew Van der Poel, Michael Van Turen out, Corny Van Kessel, Yanni Vermeer show the order as they go through uh, uh, that section past the pits 
again different we saw in uh, in Koppenberg riders taking uh, taking bikes on their uh, on the first on the first change here just a little bit more of a settling process here today yeah I think I think uh, riders kind of just want to see what the course is like at first and maybe they're not carrying too much with this first lap so they're choosing not to not to change bikes at the moment I'm sure you'll see them do that the next lap um, but it just depends if everything's working smoothly your gears are changing you're shifting well you feel comfortable on your pressures then it's not really necessary to, to change bikes straight away um, and obviously there's not much climbing in there either which, which makes a difference Michael Van Toren out you saw there just sprinting as he uh, as he tried to uh, keep momentum at the top there but at the moment we can see we're starting to get the uh, the makings of a good battle already here on the opening lap between Ellie Isabit and Matthew Van der Poel as Van der Poel came through Isabit was just bossing back just saying Do you know what I want this front position I want to lead and uh, and keep the the clear track ahead of me when you're in that position Nikki when you're when you're up against someone you know someone as as strong as Van der Poel or technically gifted as Van der Poel when we see riders on the road you kind of want to tuck in behind someone but in cross you want that a lot of the time you want that front position because we can see Issa bits fighting for it yeah you can't you can't really afford to sit behind somebody in cross because if they make a mistake you're going to make that same mistake as well and you know you need to be looking for those different lines and um, you don't really get much um it's not like you're looking for that you know shelter or anything because in these races it doesn't really matter that that much and um, you just need to keep focused on your own lines and pedaling forwards keeping that momentum going and um, so he, he wouldn't get that much benefit sat behind Matthew if you did you ever would we, we I know a lot of GCN viewers they, they love power did you ever race with power a, a power meter was there any way of comparing between a non muddy race and a muddy race I raced with it maybe once or twice in a couple of the uh, dry races that I raced in Italy, so the World Cups. But um, when it's this muddy and you're changing bikes, you know, twice a lap, it's very difficult. You can't get that much data from it. Um, but, you know, cross is it's just so different to anything else. You, you're having to make those high VO2 max efforts constantly. There's, there's not much recovery. You're constantly going over that threshold. And, um, yeah, you, you've got maybe like 300 peaks in a race. It's, it's, it's ridiculous, really. It's a lot of sprinting. So Michael Van Turen out, fights his way through to the front, onto this sand section. So if you weren't with us for the women's race, we go through deep sand and then up a little sandy climb at the top. And again, it can come down to who can keep momentum going for as long as possible. Courtney Van Kessel, Yanni Vermeersch, Tonarts are the next riders on this section here i love the way i like the i like the passion here of uh, of van Toren now the two pal sales and bingo riders at the moment really taking this to van der Poel. definitely good to see for sure is uh van Toren out's a good runner he's good technically um and yeah if he's up there he's uh he's gonna he's gonna take it to him so that's what he's doing he's not holding Actually. back Good, good. On to the road. Antoine Benoist is the French rider from Coronet Circus that's latched on to the back. Your group, Van Toren out, Van der Poel, Isabit, Van Kessel, Malia, Art. Then you've got Benoist is the uh, the next rider. Laurence Swake is the rider that's with him. And then you've got a bit of a gap back now to Tom Pidcock. 8.02 is the opening lap from that leading group. So Tom Pidcock has got Mikel Boros with him. Then comes Jens Adam, Thomas Main, Lars van der Hart as uh, the next riders. And then behind him, uh, Quinton Hermans, Shiani Vermeersch, there's Joris Nuvenus, Ben Turner going through there as well. So for uh, the young Brits, a little bit of work to do, 20 odd seconds uh, off there. Yeah, definitely some work to do, but but they have time to do it. You know, they've got just under an hour's worth of racing to go, and um, anything can happen. It's again trying to capitalise on other people's mistakes. You know, if there's some slipping out of corners or people getting technical problems or problems with the bikes, then um, yeah, there's, there's still room to move forward. And it's almost like a Constantina effect for these first few laps. People going away, coming back together, um, but now it looks like there's a there's a group starting to form there. Oh, over the top there. A little replay of that one, just uh, going through there. Um, uh, Amo, uh, 
Arnaud Debier is the rider there. Look onto this section. And they're really, really taking it to Van der Poel on this. We saw Van der Poel leading out on that opening lap. Malia just losing his footing slightly. Van Turen out of the top with Tonarts on the wheel. Van Kessel at the bottom of here. Eliezer in the road of Palsaus and Bingo. Then Matthew Van der Poel. Great to see them really taking this race to the uh, to the world champion here. This is lap two. 8.02 was our opening lap time. Tonarts there just losing it slightly at the top of that one. But uh, behind them, everyone does the same. It both yeah, you can really see how it? Yeah, <laughs> it definitely does. You can see how difficult these sections are to ride and those whips are becoming deeper every single, every single lap. And um, yeah, you might see some people go over the bars soon if they, if they get stuck in the wrong rut in the, in the wrong section. So Tom Pidcock just trying to get onto the back here. There's Antoine Benoit, the uh, French under 23 champion from memory. There's Pidcock just running up the steps, trying to get back on here at a, at a good battle with Elise a bit in the Koffenberg cross. Again, uh, Tom Pidcock coming into racing off the back of uh, a, a big road season as well. So your leading group here. Nice, uh, nice to see uh, a good bunch. That's what we've had a lot so far this season, uh, with the with the absence of uh, of Mathieu and Wout van Aert. Some nice big bunches like this coming together at, at the front of the races in the opening laps. Yeah, it's, it's great to see closed racing, especially in the muddy races. You know, these tend to be you know ones and twos on their own, but for the for the guys this year, it looks like the the racing's a lot closer, and that you know that makes makes the racing more exciting. And there's always a chance for somebody someone different to win or be on the podium at least so um yeah it's, it's, it's a race you really want need to be at the front for you don't, you don't want to be chasing behind um so everybody's fighting for the, those first one or two positions so just checking in thanks all of you for getting on board daryl schofield over on twitter thanks for uh, checking in uh glad you're enjoying nikki's uh, commentary got passed by nikki a few times in a race last year i don't think you're alone in uh, in that one Onto this run up here. <laughs> Van Turner, Arts, Van der Poel, ease a bit. As uh, the British rider gets onto the back of Ben Wast here. There's Lon Swake sprinting up there. There's Mika Borosh. Borosh getting a good start. Borosh again has made steady progress. There's your overall leader, Lars Van der Haar. Joris Neuvenhaus here. Then come Ben Turner and Timo Kielich from the uh, the Creofin team. Onto this section. Van der Poel now running the, uh, the lower slopes of uh, this we didn't really we didn't get these conditions a huge amount last year did we nikki and they really and the the sort of fast nature of the the races it did really suit van der Poel, but it just becomes so much more unpredictable when you've got this amount of mud the weather yeah it, the weather can really change the dynamic of the race and obviously this year with them being a lot more muddy and um, you'll see different riders come to the front um, you know, when, it, when it's really super fast like last year, it's, it's easier almost for, for big groups to stay away. And now it's, it's just fighting for every single section. And that's what's so great about cross. You never know what to expect. Into the pits for the bike changes. Tonarts leads out of there from Van der Poel. Ease a bit. Uh, Van Turen out. We're going to go course side with uh, Jeremy Powers and catch up with him just as Ellie East a bit comes through. Jeremy, uh, already, this is, this is exactly what we wanted, isn't it? I know we're only, uh, we're only on the second lap here, but we wanted everyone to take the race to Vanderpool. Yeah, and they are. And Vanderpool is trying to find his lines. It looks like he's obviously, at the moment, trying to kind of take the pressure, put it on these guys. But he's the new guy in town for the moment, right? He's just gotten here. And when I interviewed him earlier on, he, he showed a lot of force by saying, like, yeah, I don't, I'm not worried at all about what's here. I'm in complete control. But it was really, uh, I think the thing that you would see is that just trying to get a, like, get back in the rhythm in that first lap, in those first moments, and trying to get his, his feel for his first cross race of the season. I think that, I think we're seeing a little bit of that right now. And Eli Isabit, we've been commentating a lot on uh, Eli Isabit. He's been the man of the season so far. Nikki and I were saying, Nikki was saying in commentary, uh, a little bit uh, earlier on you know he's kind of he's got nothing to lose in effect today Elise a bit no he doesn't but the Belgian fans here Ooh. obviously Ooh, going down but but you see uh, the conditions out here are brutal a lot of fans for Eli used to be out here today screaming his name really really passionate fans you know, it's a Belgian race. They want to see a Belgian rider doing well. As you see, Vanderpool just pushing the pace. But the thing, Marty, again, I'm going to say, it's so slick here. Just behind me, 
you can see that there's a uh, there's some really nasty ruts just right here at the start finish line where the riders are coming into and i think throughout the course the sand the ruts everything is just playing into it and it's almost like you're dancing on ice out there today well thanks jeremy we'll try and check in with you again in a little bit so jeremy powers course side uh, for us today thanks all of you for getting involved uh on ball involved over on the chat from Pavel Morozov just asking if uh, Wout van Aert will start the season he's just still recovering from that uh, injury from the Tour de France as Tonarts just slides out very slightly Bill Ralph checking in from uh, Southern California in the USA where are the American riders when we see them we'll uh, we will let you know Chicken Dinner's asking, where's Ben Turner? We are getting some pictures of Ben Turner. He's kind of in that, this sort of lead group, this sort of uh, just going, swelling in numbers and uh, and shrinking all the time at East of it. And uh, Van Toren out and Tonarts working hard here to uh, correct Matthew Van Der Poel just comes through on the uh, inside of uh, that turn. Keith McRae just, uh, just giving an update. We're getting some updates as we can. Ben Turner, 15, Thomas Main, 18th out there. Thanks for uh, getting involved as well. Keith McRae, regular viewer. On to the climb, Van Der Poel. Can he stay on all the way to the top? Almost on uh, that section. Nikki takes a huge, takes a lot of power to stay on through that sandy climb. A lot of power, definitely. Yeah, you, uh, you, can, you can see it, it, you know, his strength there, uh, that depth is there from, from the road season probably. He's got that deep power um, to, park, to like go through them sand sections. And, you know, not many riders can do that. So, uh, yeah, that was good to see. His condition's good, I think. <laughs> On to the road section, so Van Der Poel and Isabit now have just a small advantage over the next riders. Michael Van Toren out trying to find his way back. Tone Arts, then Corny Van Kessel, then Tim Malia, Laurence Swake, Tom Pidcock, Antoine Benoist just coming out of that corner. So one, two and four seconds, six back to uh, Van Kessel, eight back to Pidcock, Benoist, then uh, Quinton Hermans, uh, Lars Van Der Haar. And uh, Yanni Vermeersch, the uh, next riders on the road. That front group there down to kind of Antoine, eight, five, six, seven, eight seconds. Nikki, still very small in, in cross terms. Definitely. It's, it's, there's still a group there. And I think every time they get onto that road section, they kind of back off a little bit and just look at each other, look at who's there. And then they smash it again as soon as they get into the field. And you can see it is a bit there, just trying to push on. Um, Matthews just sat, sat there on his wheel. Just kind of following his own lines. So he's a bit again, bossing it back here to Matthew Van Der Poel, comes through back up to the front all the time. You can see Ellie is a bit the, uh, you could say the man of the season so far. When we were here a year ago, it was the man in second wheel there that took the victory. We had an hour and uh, one hour and uh, 14 seconds of uh, racing last year. Wout Van Aert was second, Tone Arts third, Isabit here was fourth at 45 seconds. This group just comes back together. They'll all be hoping they can stay on across the top of that testing section. Michael Van Turen out was fifth with Tom Meus and Laurent Swaik, Lars Van Der Haar. They were about the minute, minute and five seconds down. Tom Pidcock ninth, Kevin Powells was 10th last year. We go through this race, a little bit of history. Sven Nace, 2008-2009, uh, Jdenik Stiebar back in 2010. We had Niels Albert, who had uh, Tom, uh, we had a little video from in the uh, halftime. Nace, Van Toren out, Meus and Powers, but it really has been Van Der Poel's race from 2016. He's won this on three occasions. And at the moment, everyone's fighting to try and prevent him from making it four in a row as Arts, the Belgian champion, just gets on to the back of uh, Tom Pidcock, the British champion. Yeah, hopefully Tom can move up in a couple of these next sections. You don't want to be on, on the back of this group. You need to be in the mix in the middle and, and, pu and pushing forwards. So hopefully he can get on in these next lap or two. And again, Van Der Poel through here, just testing it out. A few of you just checking in asking, Matthew Van Der Poel fanboys and Peter Sagan fanboys. If when, he's the, when he's the best in the world, you can't not talk about him. And we can't, you know, there's a lot of excitement around the, the return of Matthew. And you can see it just sliding out there um, through that corner. It's maximum slideability on the, these races through the big whoops on here. Van der Poel just getting a bit of an advantage over Isabit. It's just meters though. Isabit riding strongly, looking good here, Ellie Isabit. Yeah, Isabit's really riding a lot of these off-hand sections quite well and uh, you, you can tell he's ridden the cross bike a little bit more than Matthew and 
Matthew Ormer seems to be sat back a few times, just, just kind of watching, you know, where he's accelerating, where he's making any mistakes, and, and maybe you'll see Matthew make a, make a bit of a move in the next couple of laps. Again, for, for someone like Eastwood, we saw it in Hulst last year with Pidcock when he stayed with Vanderpool throughout. For, for Eastwood, again, it's just taking those mental notes, isn't it? Just watching how he's taking those lines ahead of him. You've got to kind of bank those, those, those things for the future. Yeah, the riders team seem to like ride a lot to have it, so you can almost predict when you race with someone a lot how they're going to race or what kind of area they might attack or what area they might lose a few seconds. So the more you race, the more you learn from somebody and um, that's where you see close racing and, and tight battle, battles coming into play in the next few weeks. So on this leading groups, there's our little cable cam there, gets that opening shot, Van Tour out uh, and uh, Swake. Uh, coming up towards the front with Issa bit Pidcock again, Pau Sows and Bingo. We've seen Nicky a lot so far this season in terms of uh, these teams starting to ride a little bit more collectively as a team. That's what they've kind of got to do here, isn't it? Just almost take that what you do on the road in just double teaming um, Vanderpool when he's up here on his own from Corridor Circus, making him chase down each one of the riders from that team. If, if, they're, if they're up there and they have the opportunity to do that, then I think why not? It's not easy to do, it's, it's working if, like, together as a team in a cross race um, because you have to be so focused on what you're doing so you don't crash or you don't slip off. Um, but if, if they've got that opportunity, which is what, what they have at the moment, then um, yeah, then they'll definitely work as a team. And it looks like they're doing that at the moment, keep attacking Matthew and put him, put him under some pressure, try and make him make some mistakes, I guess. Yeah, good, uh, nice attack there by Laurence Swig. Good question from Paul Musters. Um, what do you think about the differences in technique between Vanderpool and Isabit? Vanderpool seems a little bit more stable in the corners, but Isabit might um, benefit from uh, from his uh, kind of light weight. Matthew and, and Isabit, different stature. Does that sort of centre of gravity help in these situations? For sure, and just and just just having that cross experience, you know, Matthew. Well, both of the riders have been going for a long time, but they, you kind of have to ride to your own style and use your own body weight around them corners. And obviously, Isabit is, is quite a lot smaller than Matthew. He's, he's really tall, so um, so definitely it would make a difference in how, in how they're riding and how they're pushing on the pedals and driving through those muddy sections. Um, you know, and upper body strength makes a big difference as well. So Swake, after that attack, went uh, tight onto the barriers. Laurence uh, Swake now getting, you can see, with Isabit trying to get back onto the wheels of Matthew van der Poel with his teammate Swake just leading out through uh, that section. Then there's a bit of a gap now back to that chasing group. There's uh, Adri van der Poel, the father, and uh, in the pits. And just all queuing up here for the, uh, the cleaning station. And you can see the cleaning yeah. station brought to you by here. Uh, a bit of a queue there. You, you don't. Yeah, a bit you, of would, a... you would almost think at pro level, each one has their own has their own uh, pressure washer. Yeah, you'd like to think that, wouldn't you? But there's, I'm sure there's a lot of argy bargy going on in that air, in that pit area, and you know, pallets falling over, scrambling for the for the jet washers and things. I know Matt's been in that situation uh, with my mechanic last year. You know, just fighting for those jet washers when there's only a few there. It must help when you're Vanderpool and the, and East a bit and these guys where you've got four or five bikes instead of two or three. I imagine it be, can, can become quite stressful um, when you've when you've only got a couple, but when you've got sort of four or five all, all set up together, kind of takes the pressure off just slightly. Yeah, you, you can. Uh, yeah, you don't have to fight as much, but um, yeah, the riders maybe in fourth, fifth, sixth position, they won't have as many bikes as, as these leaders. So yeah, maybe those guys will be fighting a little bit more. So Swake getting a gap here on the run up. You can see the riders just trying to stay on uh, the bike for as long as possible. Isabit just sat onto the wheel of uh, Matthew Vanderpool. Tom Pidcock is your next rider. Tim Malia right behind him. Tonart's just remounts the Belgian champion on that section. And here we go through here. So Swake has a little look back now over the, uh, the shoulder just to see... Uh, at the end of lap three, he's uh, coming through there. Look at that, onto that section. Does he ride, he managed to ride that swake. Looking, oh, just catches it slightly at the top. He's looking super powerful today, swake. 
yeah, I think there's a line forming in that uh, in that sandy section, and maybe a few more of the guys are riding it than the women were earlier. So there's not as many footprints there. So they've got a bit of a bit of a clearer run up. But yeah, they they have to have a lot of strength to ride those sand sections like that. It's uh, it's steeper than it looks on TV. That that um, sand that sand what's, hill. What's I know the sand varies from course to course. A lot of uh, like uh, brought in sand compared to cough cider or a sort of sandy course like that does it is the weather does it help you keep, keep it compact keep it much quicker it, it really just depends on what kind of sand it is like you just said um every, every well most sands are quite different to ride to be honest um so you know that's just obviously placed there before the race that sand section and um i think some rain probably helps create those ruts where the riders can ride through them and um yeah, obviously, if, the, if, it's, if more guys are riding through those ruts, then, then more people are going to be able to ride from behind because they're not going to just have footprints in the way. Pitcock now makes it through. Tom Pitcock attacks. Ooh, goes in super hot into that Hoff camber section. Great attack, though, from Pitcock that slides out there. You can see just how much everyone is having to push it to the limit here. Swake now, Pidcock, Vanderpool, and East a bit with Arts and Malia not far behind. It's, uh, Tom Pidcock sliding out there. Tom, he's uh, he rides, he's he's right on his limit all the time, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's done really well to make up that much time in those first few laps and come back there. You know, that'll be a massive effort that he's had to put in, and hopefully he can just recover a little bit now before. Uh, before hopefully attacking again a little bit later in the race. But yeah, he's used up quite a lot of energy there to get to get back to that front group. Onto the steps, Lauren Swake, and uh, then your next group. So Vanderpool again, Pitcock, he'll be frustrated though as well, won't he? he be kicking himself. Yeah, 100%, you, 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 need, you need those good starts. It's so important in a race like this and it saves you energy towards the end. And that's important when you're, when you're full gas for an hour, you want to save as much energy as possible or, or try to lap four of eight you can see there giving a, a little run out there along the bottom so stan godry ryan camp uh andrew gorman there at 223 well says this as tom pidcock tries to get back on Vinny bastions there is uh, not far off i was just looking around to see uh, cameron mason a lot of you looking for cameron mason seeing it 31st for the young Scott Cameron Mason. So uh, Tom Pidcock's teammates back to the front. So Vanderpool comes through again past Swake. He's done uh, everything he can with his attacks here. Timo Kielik, David Vanderpool. You might see some riders going down the right hand side here. Vanderpool again. So it's the uh, it's debut of this season for uh, the world champion for Coronet Circus. Back up towards the front. Swake's got to get there. Swake's Pidcock's got to get back on quickly, as does uh, Ellie Isabit. We saw Isabit just take a little stumble on the steps. And again, Nicky, the, the, it's those m minuscule kind of errors that creep in at, at this sort of level that just cost you those fractions of a second. Yeah, you can't, you can't afford to lose anything in, the, in these races, especially when it's so tight like this and, and you can lose like, yeah, maybe even just two or three seconds on those corners by the end of the, by the, end of the race, that could add up to 20 seconds. So you really have to just keep as smooth as possible on every single section. You can see now the riders just using the bike for a bit of balance to keep their momentum on these uh, slippy, muddy off cambers. Are you almost pushing, pushing the pushing against into the bike there to just try and, as Matthew was doing there, kind of almost you're almost getting it kind of sideways, vertically that yeah. way. Yeah. Sometimes you need to think about which uh, side you're coming off your bike. If you can get off different sides on those off camber sections, then you can. Vanderpool and uh, Swake now just starting to open up this uh, little bit of a gap now. Vanderpool digging on now. Swake, those attacks early on for Lauren Swake and then attacking that sand and managing to almost ride it to the top. So this looks now, it's going to be up to that man there, Lauren Swake, to battle to stay with the world champion. We were expecting, we were waiting. What sort of condition would he be in off his uh, road section after his road season? Rather, but Vanderpool and uh, Swake, and he's just five and nine seconds. Tom Pidcock just losing a little bit here. He's now nine seconds back. 
And you can see Vanderpool just sliding left and right there. Swake staying on the bike, manages to ride that one. Nicely done again by Lauren Swake. Really does uh, ride these uh, muddy courses well, but Vanderpool remounts at the top. This beautiful shot that we have on, the, on our cable cams. Here in the Telenet Super Prestige Series of Benoit's there. There's your uh, series leader, Van der Haas at 49, Vermeersch at 55, Meusen at 106, Swake is up there, Neuvenhaus at 111, Suter still riding in at the top 10 onto the planks. Van der Poel just doesn't, uh, doesn't take any pressure, doesn't take any speed off at all. Ease a bit through there. There now comes Tom Pidcock out of that corner. So Pidcock did a lot of work, just crosses it up there over the top of that one. Tonarts. Back onto that Belgian champion's bike for uh, Tonart. But Van der Poel now uh, accelerating at the front. He's uh, almost just ridden his way back into this race. Uh, so far, you can see we're on lap four of eight. Malia and uh, yeah, Malia comes through as well. Great uh, charge now from uh, the Kriffin rider. Swake, can he get back on here? The, uh, the gaps are starting to open from the uh, the world champion. Off the, the descent, off the bridge, just eases up. Takes a bit of a breath. There's his brother, David Vanderpool's at 2.53. So you can see just how tough this course is in terms of the, the laps that we're doing here today. Thanks all of you for getting on board Rick Tech saying uh, Nino Scherter would whip those climbs. Yep, but uh, Nino uh, has so much respect for uh, the likes of Matthew van der Poel and the cross riders. A lot of people uh, wanting for wanting Nino to come and do a little bit of cross. He did, I think, early on in his career. Says he'd, uh, it's too cold in the, the winter for him. The Corinthian Circus man, the rainbow jersey at the head of the race, Swake. Trying to get back on here. This was the section last time that Swake really had dialed in. Managed to ride the whole way. He just lines up now, trying to keep the power for Vanderpool. That bike just dancing left and right underneath him. There's a gap back to Pitcock. Arts and Malia behind. Can Vanderpool stay on here? They're roaring him on. Vanderpool rides it. Keeps that. Swake's got to do the same. Doesn't manage to just a little bit. Kicks that, uh, dabs that left foot down. Nicely done there, Pidcock trying to, uh, again, stay on the bike. O Arts behind him, can Pidcock? No, doesn't stay on. So it shows the difference between those first two riders. To, uh, Kim Chapman uh, giving a little shout out there. Callum McLeod in the, the blue for uh, Canyon DHB. Now round to the uh, end of this lap here. So Vanderpool leads through. So lap, so uh, four to go this time, four to go. So Randerpool and uh, Swake are four to go. And we're going to go, Pidcock is going to go through with this next uh, chasing group with Arts, Malia and Isabits. Oh, the rider's going through there at 22 seconds. So that's a, a gap that's really growing. Nicky's back with us. Nicky, the, uh, the, the, the two leaders now, Swake, uh, again, pressure on Laurent Swake here. He's nailed a lot of the sections, that, that sandy climb. Matthew managed to, to ride it uh, this time. He, he's, he's keeping the hopes of everyone alive here now, Laurent Swake. Yeah, he's just got to, he's just got to hang in there for a, a few more laps and, uh, yeah, just, just keep going, really. It's, it looks like Matthew's got the upper hand on, on a lot of the sections, but, um, yeah, we'll see. There's a big gap now between them and third place, so hopefully he can stay there for as long as possible. Yeah, into the pits, Tom Pidcock takes a fresh bike, Malia right behind him. We saw um, in Koppenberg at, at the weekend in terms of when you're in this situation with uh, Swake and Vanderpool, and Swake just again, just battling back to, to Vanderpool. And we saw Koppenberg come down to a bike change with Pidcock and uh, Isabit. Is that something again that you're trying to, as a, when you're out here as a pro rider, anticipate whether your, uh, your opponent's going to take a bike? Yeah, I think you just have to be prepared for anything. Um, obviously now when Tom's riding with Isabel, he's going to know that Isabel could do that move again and he'll be a bit more prepared next time maybe for him not for him just to skip a bike change. And, you know, you have to be thinking of every single uh, situation that could happen in a cross race because, yeah, anything can happen. 
Um, so you just need to be so focused and so on it every, every single second, really. So it's uh, the Belgian leading from the Dutchman, Swaken van der Poel, and you've got a, a gap back. So the Brit, Tom Pidcock, is in that chasing group behind with Malia and Tonarts, the Belgian champion. A little slow-mo here of uh, Matthew van der Poel. <laughs> that's, a, that's a grim face of focus there, isn't it? Yeah, Matthew always just seems so relaxed and, and yeah, like say, focused when he's in a, in a race. He doesn't really give much away. He's just focusing on on what's coming up, what's next, and um, you can see his week, weeks are a little bit under pressure. Just, just, just there. So Sweek and uh, Van der Poel, again, you can see it sliding out. When you see that, in terms of uh, for viewers watching Nikki and trying to prep for a, for a course like this, is, did you have? as most of these guys probably have a training section which has got a bit of sand and, and some steps and trying to and trying to work out to, to be able to to prep for for the different sandy conditions i think what's great is in having these seasons and the belt you kind of know what to expect with races and a lot of the riders will actually go and practice different sections of what could be in the race coming up in their training sessions in the week or two before um, for example, last year, Coxider was one of my big goals. And so three weeks before that race, every single technical session I would do would be literally just drilling it through the sand. And I'd almost have different sections in my mind, knowing how, how long each section took and just doing that over and over again in training. And then by the time you get to race day, you just know what to expect and, and your body just becomes used to it. From Vanderpool's point of view on the front here, what would you, as a coming off the road, what, what would what would he have been doing on on his on his break between the road and trying to get ready to come back into into cross in terms of training, changing that training from the road to his cross season? I'm sure he'd add a lot more VO2 max sessions into his training. You know, focusing on that top end, his, his sprint, the sessions would be a lot shorter than he'd be doing on the road. He wouldn't be doing all those big endurance blocks. Um, and also just getting the use to being back on your cross bike, it's a very different feeling to, to being on the road bike and mountain bike and, you know, probably be doing off-road sessions. I know that he always uh, goes on his motorbike and things which will help with the, with the technical aspect and um, doing some core work, gym work um, and running as well. You have to, I think to be a cross rider, a good cross rider, you have to almost see yourself as a, as a really strong athlete rather than a strong bike rider. You have to be good all over really. And how would it check? How would now looking at where he is here in terms of uh, going forward through the cross season? How many technical sections and running sections would you kind of and expect Matthew to be doing now? I think um, once the racing kicks in, like obviously he's got quite a few races this this coming month, so you do a lot of your technical te technical work when you go around the course beforehand when you're racing. So maybe we're just doing once a week, um, probably on a Wednesday, because that's kind of the, the normal day people go and do the cross training in Belgium and Holland. Um, and then running sessions maybe once or twice a week. Um, it just it really depends what his goal is this season for cross. I don't think we really know that at the moment. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it really depends what phase you're in. Dominance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's dominance every single week. <laughs> it is. I love it. It's kind of like... The way he rides, it's like shock and awe. Shock and awe. Yeah. Just goes in, that's the tactic. Swake now, you can see, is uh, really pushing it on the limit now. Vanderpool and Swake, these are your two leaders. If you're just joining us today, welcome aboard. This is the uh, Telenet Super Prestige Cyclocross from Rudevorda. The long expected, a long awaited return of that man there, the world champion Matthew Vanderpool, as the uh, lap riders start to get pulled out on that 80% rule. So uh, a few of them, just uh, with Vanderpool, just starting to uh, to get onto them. As as uh, some of our chat forum uh, members said about getting passed by you, Nikki, in in cyclocross, there must be a kind of a sort of the wind must just go out of you when when Vanderpool comes past at this speed. I think uh, it's again you just have to keep focused a lot of the time and you kind of be polite when you go past the people especially when I do when I used to do like some lots and dorbies back home at the start of the season you kind of want to have a bit of fun with people and just um yeah it's yeah you just have to be respectful I guess. coming through coming through yeah 
everyone's trying the hardest. It's all it's uh, hard work, no matter what level you're at. Everybody's trying the same. Um, it's just some people might be going a little bit faster. So yeah, you have to have a bit bit of respect for everybody. There uh, again, they were to clerk, and uh, I can never say his name. <laughs> Mani Mario um, de Klerk, No, Mario de Klerk and uh, East of its other team manager. Mana Pennon. I can't oh, um, say it yeah, quickly. It's not easy. <laughs> My apologies. I'm sure he's got a nickname. Yeah. <laughs> Onto the sand and Van der Poel. He rode it the last time. He's got that clear uh, groove ahead of him. Decides to dismount at the top. This time, everyone just roaring on. Matthew Van der Poel, Swake attacks it. He's been looking good on this section throughout the race uh, so far. He's done it. Got to say though, uh, hats off to Swake for the for, for the defence that he's kind of done here against Van der Poel. Yeah, he's made a huge effort there to stay with him for as long as possible, and it's kind of just. Matthew's just chose his moment and he's almost been like he's sharking them first few laps. He's like, come around, watch everybody's weakness, and then it's like, okay, now I'm going to go. And everybody's just trying to stay with him. So. <laughs> <laughs> Here he comes through the line, Swake onto the road. He's not far away. He's got to try and use this section, but Vanderpool so strong on the right. Road 39, 34, three to go. Swake still in second here. Has a look back. Eight seconds. These are the next riders that are on the sand. Oh, rider just collides with our cameraman with the bike there. I think Merlier just clipped <laughs> the cameraman. The cameraman. He's got a bit of a smack around Black the head from uh, the bike. <laughs> Tonarts now. This is the point three to go where we see that sort of that late race burn here from Tonarts. This is where he can make that effort. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like everybody else is fading a little bit and he can kind of push on in the uh, last, last few laps. So maybe he'll work his way back up to that little group in front. There's a few of you on the on the chat forum as well saying we think for Ellie Elisabeth's probably had nightmares about uh, Matthew van der Poel coming uh, coming back into into racing. Just I guess what through. we can say is Matthew didn't race at Koppenberg did he two days ago, so that's kind of yeah maybe maybe it is a bit will be a bit fresher next time. You never know. Are remounting on there, so three laps to go. So the, the gap back to Swake, it's not huge. Again, when we when we look in this situation, Nikki, when you're on conditions like this, and last winter he kind of lead, kind of led a charmed life, didn't he, Matthew Van der Poel? The, the races were dry, it meant he could carry his speed, but also his equipment was just absolutely dialed to perfection. The bike, as uh, we just see Swake here, as he take a little, uh, just getting over. Oh, when we when we cut, oh yeah, there was. <laughs> When we come back to a slow mo and a replay, just uh, misses the remount. But these conditions as well, they, they, they're so heavy on on your equipment, aren't they? That a gap like this between uh, Vanderpool and Swag, it's still small in cross terms with three to go. For sure, these conditions are yeah, it's definitely um, part of character building, and you know you have to keep your head on and, and keep quite quite calm because, as we said before, anything can happen, and you know there's still three laps, three, four laps to go, so um, these riders still can't make any any kind of mistakes and they need the bikes to be working exactly as they need to be. Tone Arts, that dismounts onto the steps. We're going to go course side now with Jeremy Powers. He's uh, over there in uh, Belgium this weekend. Jeremy, what can we say? He's back and he's uh, he's still as good as he was, looking good as he was last winter. Yeah, he is back. You know, I think uh, he's now kind of on his time trial mode. He's got uh, everybody out the back, and he's able to focus on his race. Look at the lines he wants to take. You know, the gap when he came by here, he's going as hard as he can. There's no doubt about that. The gap wasn't that big back to Lawrence Sweet, but definitely the bikes are taking a beating today, Marty. They're absolutely destroyed. The clanking, the clicking, and just the, the sheer sand and grit and everything that's going through these bikes. It's a tough day out here in Belgium. <laughs> it is indeed. What's the what's the feedback been from? Have you managed to catch up with anyone coming off the course in terms of, you know, from the women's race? How it's changed from pre-rides this morning to how it's riding now? Yeah, I've been hearing that it's a lot more rutted out and it's very very slick. Although you know, with the rain stopping here, my my inclination is that it hasn't tacked up, but it's just continued to get slicker and slicker. And you can see more. It's definitely a to have the finesse, to have the patience, and I think that's what. Um, that's what 
him sitting back, dialing in his minutes before he decided to try to turn up the volume a little bit, increase the pace just a bit, but what a great ride today from Lawrence Sweet, hanging on not that far back. He isn't, and and for Van der Poel, he, this, he said in, your, in his interview earlier on, it's it's one of his it's one of his favourite courses. He's he's won this race three times and four, and looks at the moment he's going to add a four. Yeah, I mean he's uh, he's on a tear right now. He's been taking bike changes. He looks to be in control and looks like he's right back at home in the cyclocross. As you see him coming into the pits right now, we can hear through radio that he's on his bike. Everything is going well. He's definitely, like I said, Marty, he's in good control today. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. We'll try and catch up with you a little bit uh, later on. So your leaders, if you're just joining us, we're on the uh, Telenet Super Prestige Series here in uh, Rudavorda. Thanks for your company today. Thanks for all your chat. Kevin Barnett over on uh, the YouTube chat forum just saying is one dominant rider good for the sport saying kind of gets boring when the results are predetermined but uh, you've got to remember Nicky in particular we've we've I think we, we're looking at Van der Poel and the way he rides and the dominance that he has, but because we didn't get a huge amount of international TV coverage of cyclocross in Sven Nace's era, we've always had dominant riders, haven't we, throughout seasons in cyclocross? For sure, and these riders, they might be up there for, you know, two or three se seasons and then there'll be somebody new on the scene and that's that's how it's always been. It's never, never been any difference. Only now we can view it a lot more and we can see where these riders... Uh, are using their strong points where they're a little bit weaker and obviously Matthew is just unstoppable at the moment he's so dominant and no matter what he does he seems to be just um, just riding, riding away from everybody but in terms of in terms of the the way the way we can look at this as well is that we are we're we're watching something very very special and I know a lot of you are kind of you're on our chat forum are kind of like ah oh, you know Vanderpool you know but it, it, it's something great. We should, we should, we've got to celebrate in watching greatness because we look at Van der Poel, he's a new type of rider, whether it's cyclocross, mountain bike, or, or on the road. We've seen it in women's cycling, haven't we, with Mariana Voss and Pauline ferrand Prevot and, and riders like that. But in men's cycling, we've not really seen this kind of multidisciplined rider that Van der Poel is. He's been around for so long, and it's really just the last couple of years where he's just coming to his own. You know, he's, you can see physically he's changed quite a bit, um, and at the moment he's just yeah, is 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 what all the riders aspire aspiring to be like. And I think it does still push the sport forward because you're you're obviously always trying to catch up with him and and trying to be as good as him. You're looking at his technique, what he's doing, probably asking him a lot of questions off the bike, so um, to see what training he's doing and. Yeah, you, you can see as well, he's, he's just enjoying it out there and, and he's just riding his own race. It's good to and see. The, and the other riders as well, they've got to figure out how to step up to this. And, and, and uh, I've got, few, again, a few shout outs. John, John Clark over there, Anthony Hilgos as well. T don't don't walk away stay with it because this is something this is something different this is something special and you've got to look at the conditions and look at the courses and uh, Nikki every course that you do and you've done pretty much all of them on the circuit every course is different anything can happen in cyclocross yeah it, it's horses for courses you, you know you see some riders that will just be totally up there in the mud, muddy races and then when it gets to the super fast ones they're like in 10th 15th position and they find it really hard it's it's you know every week's different in cross and every course is different and every year it's different and that's what's so exciting about it you never really know what's going to happen or who's going to be up there obviously Matthew is, is amazing at pr pretty much every course at the moment um, but you know you see riders popping up and being able to stay with him and, and compete with him for the first few laps which is only going to push everybody forward in the, in the, in the long run and what can what can change it can change quickly can't it because we we watched the we saw the the shifting of generations as tone arts just runs the the sand section here we saw the shifting of generations two to go this time we saw the shift from sven nace and we saw it from mara de Klerk, bart velen sven nace then into vanderpool and wout van Aert, and pidcock and east a bit and tone arts and the other young riders coming through as they mature as as athletes, you know, the, they will step up. Yeah, there, there's so much room for improvement with these young riders like Tom and um, is it? But you know, they, you know, you don't realise still how young they are and how much they they're going to develop over the ne next coming years and, and gain strength and and they'll find their form and you know you, you maybe see one of them becoming a lot more dominant in the next couple of years and. Um, 
the more the more racing they do, the more they get, um, the more they progress, and then, then they're going to be fighting for for that win a little bit more. So with two to go, Laurence Swate, then at 20, Arts at 34, then comes uh, Tim Malia is the next rider. So Malia goes through, and then Isabit. So Malia, Isabit, Pidcock, Pidcock is not far away there, Tom Pidcock. So this group here, so going through, Isabit's at 103, Malia's at 53, Pidcock at 110. Going through, they're looking at, the, you look at the time so here, and Swake's only at 20, Arts is at 34. We've, we've got two laps to go, all it takes, a puncture, a broken chain, putting the bike down, sliding out on a section. It's not an unsurmountable gap that, that Laurent Swake is holding here at 20 seconds. No. All these riders, you know, they've got two arms, two legs at the end of the day. They're all human and anything can happen at any moment. And, and especially in the last couple of laps of a cross race, you know, there's those, those ruts are getting super deep now. And I, I know from experience that a lot of big, big rocks and stones are under there. And if you hit one of them and go over the handlebars, you know, there's a lot of different things that can happen so you know he needs to keep focus week and, and keep driving forward you know you, you just don't know what's going to happen the hamburger cyclist love your name um is just asking <laughs> is it allowed to use uh, hands on the barriers so hand slinging kind of off the big um, wooden course markers yeah I don't, I don't think there's ever been a problem with that i mean it's not always the fastest option to be honest i think a lot of people just do it because <laughs> You know, there's, a, there's something there that you can maybe pull on to to try and keep keep it going forwards. But um, if you can get off before that happens and run, then it's probably going to be faster than, than grabbing onto a barrier. Sometimes slows you down. So Vanderpool, your leader from Coronan Circus. Just a few comments as well. Jalimi bike over there in Mexico. Just nice to saying quite a few of you commented about live data and live telemetry and that kind of thing. And uh, Nikki, it's it's near. It, you, if you've got five bikes, you'd need five power meters and and five different computer head systems to be able to make that work, wouldn't you? It, yeah, it's, it's super difficult to get any kind of power data in a cross race. I mean, you you can definitely train with a power meter in training. You're not really having to change bike or. And um, so you can get some numbers from that, but you always can manage to find a little bit more in those cross races. So you're never going to get true numbers unless you've got a power meter stuck to you somewhere. I don't know. It's, <laughs> nothing's been invented like that so far, but yeah, maybe maybe that's for the future. You never know. So uh, there they have it. Uh, Matthew Vanderpool, your leader. So we're not far away now. It'll be one lap to go when he comes around uh, next time. And uh, Matthew Van der Poel, he's got all the backup team. His grandfather's been a bit poorly. I haven't, a few of you asking for updates on uh, Matthew's uh, grandfather. I haven't seen any um, recently. I'll uh, do my best to try and uh, find out for you. It's uh, powering on here. And uh, again, a few of you about the, uh, the, the TV director focusing on, on Matthew. They tend to focus on the, on the head of the race. I'll send my friend Gunther a message. He's, he's uh, a big TV director over in Belgium. I think he does a lot of these. I'll, 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 pass, on your, uh, I'll pass on your feedback to, to Gunther and see what, uh, see what we can do for the future. We'll get the belt when they come around next time into the, uh, the pits for the bike change. And all the, all the spray uh, from the mechanics, Nicky, it kind of makes that section even more, uh, even more difficult to ride. Yeah, it's not easy. Even just going through the pits, it's kind of like you don't really want to change because it might slow you down, but at the same time, you're going to get a fresh bike out of it. So, yeah, you can see the, the riding right to the end of the pit, so that must be fast, faster than, than the other side. Little update from uh, Jan Gelderloos. Uh, the goals from for Vanderpool for next year classics included Paris Bay, and yeah, I just saw before we uh, before we came on air that Corandon Circus have got a start in the Vuelta next year, so that will. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Pretty good. <laughs> that's really good, but they they've said they need to sign a few more riders just to kind of take the pressure off off Mathieu. <laughs> that that be yeah. interesting. <laughs> really interesting. To wait we'll and see, see that one. Yeah, see how that affects the uh, coming in. A Grand Tour that late, uh, that's going to... I don't know if a Grand the Vuelta just before coming into cross season might need a little bit more of an extended break before you come into into cross. Looking at how sometimes the riders come out of a, of a Grand Tour, you either come out absolutely flying, don't you, or absolutely, absolutely creeping. 
I can't see that I'd make um I can't see that I'd really benefit a cross rider to be honest. But maybe maybe if you didn't start the cross season until de- December, January and maybe that's what Matthew could do, just just jump straight in at the end of the season and still win races, I don't know. But you definitely need a big rest after a grand tour. What a race. This man uh, if you if you haven't checked out, I know I shouldn't find anything that I do funny, but have you, I hope you enjoyed our little Matthew Vanderpool preview this week over on our social media. So check that out if you haven't seen it. It's on my you got at Marty Mac TV and at, at GCN Tweet over on uh, and Global Cycling Network on Instagram. If you didn't see our little Matthew Vanderpool uh, preview, uh, we had a little bit of fun in the week. Go and uh, go and uh, go and check it out. Anthony Hill Goss was asking, would they ever consider using split screen coverage, seeing, showing leaders and other riders? That's a good idea, actually. Good, good little feedback. Yeah, we see it from idea. time to time. Yeah, I haven't seen that before, have you? No, no. And especially no. when you get someone this dominant, just kind of so many seconds in front of their second place, it'd be handy to see what's going on behind. It would indeed. We haven't seen that much in cross. Good, eff- good uh, suggestion, Anthony. I'll, I'll put that into my. Uh, Put in my uh, list of things to talk to them about. Stephen Cowman asking, uh, how long does it take to make a Dugas tyre? Um, Dugas and Challenge, lots of riders on them. The uh, the Dugas tyres are uh, a good uh, a good choice. Lots of riders on those. Yeah, Dugas for sure. I always used to use them, and it's it's whatever one you you feel comfortable on. But for sure, tubs make a huge difference to to that confidence and you know riding low pressures, riding through sand sections. It's, uh, it's a massive benefit. Matthew Vanderpool on the sand. Class Engstrom just uh, commented, why not comment on the race? Matthew Vanderpool's been clear for quite a while. So uh, we do try and take our questions as well from our social media. This is uh, what we are. We're a community here on uh, GCN. Your uh, solo leader, Matthew Vanderpool, taking quarter to quarter, pushing it to the limit here. Um, if you weren't with us uh, last winter over on GCN Racing, just on uh, Facebook, I hope you're enjoying it. Now we're uh, free to view on uh, YouTube as well. Remember, we have no comment as well. Uh, control over what you see. We get what you see. Um, that's all we have. We're uh, taking the uh, the feed from the live broadcast. Tone Arts on to this sandy climb. Kenny manages to stay on. Just gives a little hand sling, a little foot oh. off uh, there. Nice technique as Vanderpool goes through with one to go. Yeah, you can see he's, uh, he's actually coming back on sweep, I think, quite a bit, that last half a lap, so we'll see if he makes a more time. Going through last lap, one lap to go, bell lap for Lauren Sweet, goes through there 20 seconds, so he's holding it nicely, is uh, Sweet. He was at 20 seconds last lap, Arts was at 30 for the last time that we uh, went through. Ellie Isabit is uh, riding in fourth wheel here, going through uh, Tone Arts is at 38. So just lost a few seconds there as uh, Arts and then Tim Malia. The thing is when it's changing so much, all the laps, every, every single lap can be different. You know, you can ride one, one, one time and then you might have to get off and run the next. As, as soon as you feel like you're going to slow down, it's almost like you have to be off your bike before that, before that moment just to keep the momentum. Um, so you might see some riders able to ride a few more sections, one lap, and then the next you can lose a couple of seconds. He's a bit just checking his watch as he goes through. Malia at 51 and uh, he's a bit goes through at 113. Pidcock. So these two, Pidcock and Isabit, they're the Van der Poel and Van Aert of their uh, next generation of riders. This man, this is uh, Pidcock goes through. 127, Corde Van Kessel is the next rider. Van Kessel again, Nicky, he's, a re- he's, a, he's one of those riders that's always there and thereabouts. He just seems this year as well, quite a solid start. This is the sort of position that we, we see Van Kessel in these sort of races. Yeah, it, it can kind of perform on any kind of course, to be honest. It's just, yeah, he's not quite at the top end of the race. He's not quite fighting for that win every single time, but he's always in that top ten. He's a really great, consistent rider. And uh, just uh, checking in, Paul O'Neill, why bike changes? And uh, big thumb, thanks. Uh, thanks, glad you're enjoying the... Uh coverage our bike changes is because the uh, the weight builds up and a clean bike means less weight um, it's kind of a combination of quite a few things why we change bikes in cross Nikki 
Yeah, less weight. Um, you're able to get a bit, a bit more grip when you've got a clean tread on your tyre. Um, gears, gears, especially in this race, you're going to have a lot of sand, a lot of mud getting stuck in there. And, you know, you want a clean, fresh bike. And also just the confidence. It just makes you feel good when you jump on a, a clean, fresh bike. And it just makes you feel fast, even if you're not necessarily going faster. It's, uh, it's um, a nice feeling to have a fresh bike. And it also just limits the risk of any mechanicals. Oh, it's oh. all going horribly wrong there for Ellie a bit. <laughs> that allowed Tom Pidcock to come back. You could sense the frustration as uh, they went through there. And uh, Stephen Ronker saying the definition of greatness. Everyone expects him to dominate. The riders try to stop him from dominating. And again, it's not his. It's not Matthew's fault that he's so <laughs> dominant, is it? No, definitely not. He's, uh, he's definitely got some good genes. And he obviously works hard, he's great technically, and he's been doing it for a long time. You know, the more that you do something, the more you become a master of it. And he's been doing, doing these races since he was probably eight, nine years old. So you have to remember he's got a lot of experience. He's not far away now. We, uh, the expectation on his shoulders on the return. I think, he, I think he will be missing his buddy Wout, though, as well in these races. Yeah, for sure. I think we'll, um, hopefully we'll see Wout return in a couple of months, in a month's time maybe, and, and put up a bit of a fight to him. It was, I thought it was quite nice, the trading tweets when Wout got his stage win in the tour and that kind of thing. There's kind of that, that mutual respect between those two. I, th I think with a lot of riders, you get a lot of that respect. I mean, obviously when you're on that start line, when you're in a race, you're fierce and you're competitors and you know, you're out to beat each other. But off the bike, there's no reason for you to be like that. And, you know, you, I think they're actually quite good friends. And even a lot of the riders, you see them chatting before the start. And then it's almost like as soon as it's two minutes to go, everybody puts a mask on and, and you're there to do a job and, and go for that win. He wants a clean bike for the finish. The world champion on those world champion Canyon bikes wants to come in to the finish with a fresh one. Great crowds out. At the, when we when we kind of ride our local cross races, uh, in what you've been in here with the with the crowds at this size, the noise just must be amazing. It is. It is it's so weird. Like when you're on a good day, you don't actually notice any noise. You're kind of that much in the zone that you're so focused and you're. You're concentrating on, on every single line and, and every single section that's coming up. And it's only really that last, yeah, maybe last 100 metres where you're like, oh, actually, there's a lot of people here and they're shouting for me. Um, it's, it's maybe not a good day when you can just hear what everybody's saying because then you're really not focused on the race. But, yeah, it, 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 makes, it makes a difference. A little shot there, Chris Bly. Thanks for uh, your comments as well. Glad, glad you're all in, enjoying the coverage today. If you're all getting out and racing today, good luck. Make sure you uh, you watch these. These are these are great. Uh, watching Van der Poel, he's a bit Pidcock Arts. All these riders watching everyone in action here. It's a great sort of lesson video, isn't it, for for an amateur cross rider. Yeah, even, even for the pros, to be honest, like, that's one thing that I, since I've stopped racing, I'm like, oh, damn, I wish I would have actually watched more racing and watched the men race a bit more, maybe watched our races a little bit more. Uh, just because you learn so much, you see what other people are doing, you can go out and, and practice different things in training, and training, and that's how you progress and obviously get better. And So I think definitely for, for all young riders, for, well, for any riders, really, just to watch these guys and actually watch the women, what they're doing, it's, uh, yeah, just... Yeah, get as much info as possible and, and use it in your training sessions and your own races. I love you as well commenting on the, the aerial shot. It's a it's a cable cam. Don't drones drones of the past, cable cams of the future. Invest in a in a cable cam. There are quite a few around. You won't get a drone near a bike race, so uh, get a cable cam. You can ha have a search online, get one of them. Van der Poel on the bridge, the world champion, these rainbow stripes. We've been waiting for them. He's gonna open his season with a victory here in uh, Rudevorda. It's going to be four times now for Matthew uh, van der Poel to have stood on the uh, top step of the podium in uh, this one. There's going to be a, a few riders in here as well, kind of shrugging their shoulders, saying we tried at the start, but a bit of work to do. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think um, probably everyone expected this just because of how dominant it was from last season, but the kind of hopes that things might be a little bit different. But it's again, horses for courses, and maybe next week they might be able to put up a little, little bit more and fight for longer. And yeah, you just don't know, but yeah, Matthew is obviously 
not really lost anything from last season. He's, he's able to come straight back into it. It's, you know, on the road, win out still gold. A few other bits and pieces throughout the season. What a year he's had. We're on it to the sand. And uh, he, can he stay on the bike all the way to the top? And look at the power of Van der Poel. Right, there, right <laughs> to the barrier there. Absolutely uh, phenomenal. The, the, just the demonstration of power there. Unbelievable. We're going to get a showboat off the top of here. Yes, there we, we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's definitely a showman at the same time, isn't he? That's uh, why everyone really loves watching him and loves him as an athlete. Just because, yeah, here he's got, he comes. got a good personality. Into the finish, he is back. Everybody, Matthew Van der Poel high fives the fans along the side. He, the world champion, sits up, punches the air. It's a victory for the Corridan Circus Man. A great battle all the way from the start. They did absolutely everything that they could to try and. Uh, Take this one. Hats off to hats off to this man though. Lauren Swait did everything he could. The Pal Thousand being goal rider. Many attacks. Rode the sand uh, beautifully as well. Went toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe for Matthew Vanderpool. Wasn't able to stay with him in the end. Tonarts comes in now. Third spot on the podium for Tonarts. Tim Malia for Griffin is going to take fourth place a few riders coming back towards the finish another strong rider on the road Tim Malia yeah he's a he's a very strong rider he's a Belgian national champion isn't he? so he's a, he's a great rider on the road there you have it a little tap on the helmet there for uh tone arts and he's a Belgian road champion isn't he Tim Malia there you yeah it. Little high fives to the crowds. That's a bit of I love about Cross as well. When you see the, the best in the world coming down, high fiving everyone alongside. It means a lot to the fans, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. I don't think you get as, as much as in the uh, GBB trophy because obviously we're fighting for every second to that line. But yeah, you can enjoy the win, you know, and obviously give the crowd a bit of a high five. Makes them happy. Fifth. Fifth place for Ellie Isabit here. He's uh, in towards the uh, the finish, cross the line. So for uh, 138, Isabit Pitcock is sixth. Another uh, solid ride here from Tom Pitcock from Trinity Racing. Did again, had a few attacks. Might be uh, again, kind of pick, uh, you'll go back and he'll analyze this one of <laughs> Corny Van Kessel. Shaking his head today. That's an exhausted looking <laughs> Corny Van Kessel there. Yeah, these riders are going to be absolutely shattered when they get home tonight, I'm sure. Maybe for another day or so as well. Post, uh, post race pizza, I think, tonight for Corey Van Kessel and a few beers. Tom Mewson, we uh, see Tom Mewson coming in again. Good ride today by Tom Mewson coming back into uh, here in uh, eighth place for him. And I think Quentin, Quentin Herman's just behind him. Yeah, Tom's had a great season already this year. He's uh, found to, seems to have found his legs a little bit more, and hopefully, we'll see him up there a little bit in some of the coming races. He was the man for a while, Tom Mewson, the ice man. Here's uh, Dieter Swig uh, coming up towards the line. That's a good. That's a good performance from uh, from Dieter as well today. Top ten for Dieter Swig, the uh, the other brother. Lars van der Haar, series leader up towards the line. Van der Haar is 11th for Lars van der Haar today. Let's uh, count a few more riders in. Uh, coming in towards the finish, Yanni Vermeersch is the next rider to uh, cross the line. We'll try and uh, see if they give us a uh, top 20 here. Hopefully they'll uh, let us see our riders in. So uh, 11th, Meissen is going to come in 12th for German fans. So German champion there, Marcel Meissen. Uh, is this Ben Wass, the French uh, under-23 champion, coming in towards uh, the finish. He had a good start today, didn't he, um, Ben Wass? Yeah, he did. He was up there that first couple of laps, wasn't he? And, and pushing on a little bit. And, um, it's good to show your face, and actually, it just yeah, it, it gives you a lot of confidence when you have a start like that, even if you drift back a little bit towards the end. <laughs> Michael Van Toren out again. He had a good start. Dan Suter as uh, 
these two riders come in towards the finish. Van Turen out. And again, you can just see the fatigue. It's worth watching all the way through, isn't it, for uh, for these uh, for these riders? So Suter and Van Turenhout are your next uh, finishers. Yeah, you can just see how hard this cross race has been today. You know, they're all on the start line, you know, raring to go, and then after a few laps, you can just see that you know how hard and heavy these races, how physically demanding it is to be out there doing them. As a pro, is it, you know, the, the, the difference between a dry day and these super muddy days, it, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's such a, it kind of as a, for us mortals watching and looking at, at you pro riders when you're in there, the, the amount of power and energy that it takes when you're, when you're at, this, at this level, at this speed, because cross, it's just relentless now, isn't it? There's, there, it, doesn't, it doesn't ease up at all. No, you have to be so robust as a cross rider and, you know, you have to be fighting week in, week out. Um, there's no let up and in every single race, you know, you're on the limit the whole time. There's, there's not many sections where, not many races where you come off and you think, oh, I feel quite fresh now. You just never, ever do that. <laughs> Looking at Laurent Swake crossing, crossing the line and today, uh, do you know what? I think that I know we see Laurent Swake, you know, he takes victories. We've seen him take victories in Brico Cross and Etias Cross. And again, he's a, a, a rider that's always there and there about. I don't know what you think. For me, that's one of Laurent Swake's strongest rides against the likes of, of Matthew from, from start to finish. For sure, you know, he, he really put up a good fight at the start of the race and took the race on and then in that midsection he was kind of just patient, just trying to stay with him for as long as possible and he should be, well I know he'll be super happy with that and um, yeah, he's uh, for sure one of his best races probably of his career so it's really great to see him doing that and maybe we'll see more of him in the coming weeks as well. <laughs> a few comments along the bottom. Stefan van Van Gogh in there. The king is back. He uh, he, he <laughs> definitely is. And 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 we we talk about it and we see. I see a lot of the comments as well on the forum in terms of of uh, van der Poel's dominance. But as we as we say, it's up to everyone else to to step up and try and find a way forward, isn't it? Yeah, like I said before, everybody just you know everyone has two arms, two legs, and obviously some people are a little bit more talented, a little bit more better at times than others, and. You know, this is obviously Matthew's time and he's really dominating the sport. And no matter what he does, he just seems to be thriving in it. So um, all the other riders can do is just keep training as hard as they can and, and trying to match him and hope for, hope for him to have a few bad days so they can actually match him. And he said as well, he's not going to do as many cross races as he has he's done in the past because now he's mixing the cross, the road, his mountain bike as well. He can't do those double weekends, can he? You, you, it, it, you can't be able to race like that, you know, year after year after year. I think just generally as a rider, the older that you get, you really have to select, select the races that you go for. You have to target certain events. And obviously Tokyo is one of his events next year and he'll, he'll already be thinking about you know, what's coming up next week, next month, and, and making sure he finds that balance in his training and racing. So a question from Arnie here. So we saw about the risk of Vanderpool being blown off after a few years, never taking an off season. We saw, we kind of saw that with Mariana Voss. Is it okay to be in, in shape all year round? That's a good question. I think you really have to, I think it's, when you're a young rider, you can almost afford to do it. You know, the more races, the better, you know, the more experience you have. But as you get older, to find that very top end condition to be competitive in the, in the world's best competitions, you have, to, you have to take some risks, miss some races, take some time out for training blocks to keep that condition high the whole season. Because when you tend to race, race, race all the time, you end up just being so fatigued at the end of the season, those last couple of months. And um, yeah, it's almost like a downhill spiral and you know you've seen it with Sophie Debor as well like she said it's very easy to overtrain and overdo it especially when you're younger so you have to really find that balance between between racing and resting and recovering and focusing on different goals when we when we see riders sort of week in week out where we're doing those sort of kind of double weekends and you've got all that all that travel in between how does how does your training as the course of the winter go? Because he will have come off the back of that that World Road Championships and you, he, he would have had to take a good rest, wouldn't he, in order if he wants those goals next year, if he wants that Olympic mountain bike title, he wants to ride Paris-Roubaix and see how he, how he gets on with that. He would have had to take a, a, a complete rest in, in essence. <laughs> 
And the thing what riders do is obviously they well they have a, a plan probably a year out from from different competitions and he'll know his rest periods they'll know the times he needs to swish off and it's not just a physical thing it's mental as well you have to be mentally fresh especially for cross because it is so intense and it is so tiring you know the whole day you get to a race you you're getting out your camper or your, your car you're doing pre-laps going back sorting your bike out it, it's it's not just like a race it's it's everything around it and you have to take time out to to almost just take a step back and and refresh before before your next race is or your next season so you have to you have to really balance the season out good question from chris constantine nikki did you prefer racing in the cold or when it was it was warmer oh definitely the cold i always was a cold weather rider and i, I never used to like racing in the heat i remember one year when we did the giro it was just a whole suffer fest and my body just seems to react better in the cold conditions and i guess that's why primarily i was a cross rider <laughs> And I suppose for some people that that are watching that might be new to cross or or have never or have never done cross and they and they see it when it's when it's you you you're losing your shoes in the mud and you're absolutely plastered in mud but for you as cross riders and pro cross riders whenever I would talk to anyone there's always a massive smile on on your face when you when you when you see really muddy conditions yeah, it's a, it's almost like if you have all the preparation right, you know, you're warming up before your event, you, you've got the right clothes, you know, you know what to expect and you, you like being outdoors, you like different conditions and um, yeah, every time it rained or it was really rubbish weather, that's when I'd really be like, yes, I can't wait to race today and almost when it was drier and kind of really warm, I'd be like, oh yeah, not really excited for it. Um, but different riders obviously want different conditions and um, yeah for me it was always those muddy tough cold conditions that were the best now we'll stay once I get an I get a word that we've got the podiums we will we will go to the uh, to the podiums we've we've seen over the last three days that the difference between that we had the Koppenberg cross which just went up that straight up that that iconic climb and then and then today's race which couldn't be any more couldn't really be any more different course wise if it tried Did, would you as a as a rider and those pros that we've we've seen race today does does the warm up going into that change in terms of for someone like Matthew making sure that you you're absolutely you know on the start line ready to ready to rock and roll do you, does your warm up change from a hilly race like Koppenberg to something like today it doesn't change in the terms of what you actually do, like on your turbo, on your rollers or out on the road, but it probably changes the times a little bit. So obviously Koppenberg, you know, you're into that explosive effort uphill straight away. So you want to be as, as close to the warm up, getting off your rollers or turbo as possible, as, as close to the race, sorry. Um, but a lot of the time it's, it's, you know, riders ride to habits and you have the same kind of um, pre-race routine and it helps to take your mind off being nervous or, or anything else that's going on around you so you try and keep the same um, the same warm-up week in week out the only time you might change it is when it's super cold and you want to warm up for a little bit longer and in terms of now we've got the week we've got a week now for till the European Championships you're you're a coach now as well where for those riders we see it a lot more on the road we don't get an awful lot of pictures but in terms of cooling down warming down afterwards and then going through this this week in terms of trying to to make sure that you're in top form because the european championships as as most um continent championships really really important now that's the thing it's different races are gonna people are gonna have different goals through the season like for some riders it might not be that important for the european championships but for other riders it's going to be massively important and around a cross race it's all about looking after yourself making sure you get your recovery right your, your nutrition right so that you're on peak performance every single week or as best as you can be you know it's very easy to to get sick you're always on your limit and um, some riders will be taking a bit of a t taper week this week so they'll be going a lot easier in training so you'll see different people maybe come to the front next week. Other people will be training through races. It's uh, it's really dependent on your own goals. And in terms of those riders today, we got we kind of got to look at our uh, young riders as well. Going going in today, Tom Pidcock was leading in the under twenty three classification ahead of Ben Turner and Timo Keeling. But those under twenty threes, those younger riders, and we do forget that they are still a lot of them under twenty threes. They would have taken a, a bit of what would you say they can take away from today. Um, I guess it's just the whole thing of just that they just want to keep in the mix every single race and keep pushing forwards and they're not necessarily probably looking at the under 23 riders they'll, they'll, they'll know who to look out for and who's going well and 
and who's around them. So it just changes your dynamic and a little bit of how you're thinking when you get get on that start line next week if it if it's a bit of a different competition. So a great course you can see here that we've had in Rudevorda. I know a lot of you were uh, loving that cable cam. We we're, we're just waiting for our uh, our podium in terms of uh, the riders getting themselves uh, cleaned up and uh, and ready for the podium. Some great shots here of Matthew van der Poel. That really was uh, here. Just has a little glance up, sort of the moment when he managed to uh, get away. Swake right behind him, and again, look at the face of uh, Laurent Swake here. And this sand, this sandy climb here, Nikki, really, again, really proved to be decisive. Yeah, you need to be so powerful through it, and it's it's almost like if you ever feel like you're going to go slow down, you have to get off before that moment and run. And um, I think as the riders rode the course more and more through the race, they just got more confident in that and, and riding those sections. And it's almost like you have to force somebody else to make a mistake or, or a, a bit of a delay for you to make your move. And obviously that's where Matthew felt confident that he could really just power through there and, and get that gap. So everyone now, you can see the kids now out playing in the sand, build a bit of the sand castles afterwards. I think one of the best bits across for me has always been watching the young riders going through and the kids riding round. Because we used to see Thibaut Nace riding round on his on his tiny little bike. And now you see him kind of coming through and, and sort of the next generation. It's amazing just like these courses are actually set up a week in advance of the races so you'll often get a lot of kids going round you know I, I used to try and get on the course a few days before the race and you know there'd be tons of little kids going around on the on the tiny cross bikes and you know pretending that they were Sven Nice or you know Matthew in their in their kind of copied kit and it's just so amazing to see them just out there and enjoying it and having fun and that's what that's what it should be about. And in terms of you if you've never been able to uh, to get over Coming to uh, one of these cyclocross races, if you if you ever get oh, get the chance to come over, it's a good the, a good com good combination, Nick, isn't it? It's to go to the Ghent Six Day, and there's always a big cyclocross that weekend as well. Yeah, it's usually um, Cockside that weekend, so it's it's not far from from the coast. Obviously, it's easy for people to get across to, and um, yeah, it's. It, Coxider is one of the best races ever. It's um, it's got such a history behind it. It's it's amazing. I love it. So, yeah, definitely, I'd encourage people to come over for that if they can experience a real cross. I thought he was going for a two knee two knee <laughs> slide there live on TV. His mum would be. Uh, I think his mum would be ready to uh, chuck his clothes in the in the bin afterwards. I think if he uh, yeah. if he if he went for that one. <laughs> it's got a lot of energy. Yes, there's always the, again the main, the main thing as well. There's always a great there's always a great DJ at these races as well. They always have a good party afterwards. Ah, oh, the, the Belgians love the beer tent. You know they'll be in there absolutely getting slashed up about two hours before the race. So um, <laughs> yeah, they, they love a good dance and a good beer. The Belgians. On the podiums, ready, uh, Matthew Van der Poel. We're uh, seeing him for the. Uh, First time this winter for uh, Corandon Circus. Always great. He's always so ready to to greet the fans. I was at the Tour of Britain and he was. They absolutely loved him. Yeah, he's so personable. You know, you know, you see him chatting with everybody. There's nothing. Um, he's definitely got his feet on the ground, and that's probably why he does have, have so many fans because people relate to him and and um, see him as a normal person and not just a superstar. Here we have the announcing of the podium. Tonarts from Telenet Bawas Lions. Good to see uh, good to see three teams represented on the podium as well today. Yeah, I'm sure they'll be super happy with that getting some um, get, getting some uh, sponsors out there and, and a bit of a show for them. That's good. Yeah, so Tonarts you could see was pleased with that finish, went into today's race. Fourth overall with 32 points. Put some time into the riders, uh, some points into the riders behind him. Laurence uh, Swake, great ride from the Pal Sows and Bingo Man today. Stands on the, the second step of the podium. He's got to be super happy with that ride today. Yeah, for sure one of his best of his career. It's, he'll remember that day and it'll give him confidence for the coming weeks, I'm sure. 
So there's your second and third placed riders. So for the first time this winter, and definitely not going to be the last, Matthew Vanderpool onto the podium for Corandon Circus, the world champion in that rainbow jersey. There is your one, two, three today. A great return to uh, the battle early on. He manages to ride away and take the victory. He is the king, as a lot of you have been saying on our chat forums. I'll just as well thank all of you for getting involved today over on uh, Twitter as well. Peter Cody, thanks for uh, saying hi over on there. A hundred pages of the chat I've got. So thanks all of you on our uh, cross community here on GCN Racing. Thanks for getting involved. Matthew Vanderpool, Laurent Swake and Tonart is your podium today and that's it the racing thanks to nikki bramia for uh, joining us today she will be back in january and uh, you should you will have a new arrival in tow yes hopefully yeah uh, yeah i'll have a little baby with me next time so hopefully she's but on a good good quiet day <laughs> mini bramia has got to make their first uh, international tv appearance on our, uh, our coverage in january we won't yeah, i'm sure, sure she'll do that i'm sure matt will be doing a, a good job there thanks to nikki for her, all her insight today thanks all of you for watching we're back next weekend for the european championships to certain territories get out there and ride from me marty mcdonald and nikki bramia we'll see you soon bye for now